to everyone present here. We now continue with the proceedings of the National Conference 2022 on Paradigm Shift in Business Management, Emerging Trends and Competitive Strategies. I take immense pleasure in introducing our next guest, keynote speaker, Dr. Abhay Badani. Dr. Badani, an MTech, has earned his PhD in Telecom and Decision Sciences from the School of Telecommunications and Management, IIT Delhi. He heads the Data Science Division and works as a technical architect at Yatra.com. Having gained about 10 years of industry experience in various sectors, including research in building solutions using data science and machine learning in healthcare, telecom, aviation, and hospitality, Dr. Badani has built and guided several cutting-edge products, including NLP, machine learning, and data science skills. Some of the successful projects in use are email, bot, personalized interactive voice response system, chatbots, information retrieval engines, recommendation systems, anomaly detec detection, customer segmentation, and large-scale dynamic discounting, among others. His research work has been presented in few top conferences and journals around the globe, such as Informs, DSI, ACM Compute, and SOM. In addition to these, he has published two book chapters related to big data and NLP methods apart from two journals and multiple conference papers. He is passionate about AI for social good, AI ethics, and AI in the agricultural sector. We are pleased to have you, sir. I now request Dr. Monica Gorke, Assistant Professor DYPIMS, to felicitate Dr. Abhay Badani. I request Dr. Badani to inspire us with his talk. Uh, hello uh, and uh, very good afternoon to everyone. So I'm really thankful to D.Y. Patel Institute of Management. Uh, uh, Professor Asutos, Dr. More, Mr. Mane, uh, Dr. Pallavi Kudal, uh, the conference organizers, participants, eminent speakers, students, and researchers. I'm really glad to be part of this national seminar on paradigm shift in business management, emerging trends, and competitive strategies. <clears throat> Today, COVID has changed uh, almost everything the way we used to do earlier. Uh, so have the businesses. So few businesses were more vulnerable and few enjoyed the COVID blessings. And uh, Yatra is one of the badly affected. Uh, Yatra means uh, tourism sector or uh, travel industry is badly affected due to COVID, right? And so I'll, I'll basically try to uh, share my experiences, what we did as a company uh, to basically handle this situation and overcome this uh, uh, trauma, right? So I'd like to present my screen. Uh, okay, yes. Let's just a minute. I hope uh, it is visible. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. All right. So, so I would like to, uh, since this is a, a, a afternoon session, so can you uh, can someone tell me uh, how many number of species exist in this world? There are approximately eight point seven million species. And possibly researchers have identified 1.6 million of them. How do we? How many of them do we remember? Somewhere about thousands. And how many of them we are able to recognize? Hardly 200, 300, right? So why is this so? That we are in, uh, there are th millions of species, but we are only able to recognize hardly in hundreds, right? 
So who is the most intelligent animal in the jungle? Fox, right? And fastest animal on the earth? Cheetah. Tallest animal? Giraffe, right? However, as I mentioned that who is clever, who is uh, tallest, who is fastest, it doesn't matter. You have to be lion uh, or uh, you should have uh, abilities of a lion. So that's why it is called king of the jungle. And the reason is it is bold, courageous, confidence remains calm, never afraid of facing any challenges, no matter how big, bad it may, might be, right? So I am sure uh, all of you must be knowing uh, this person, right? Dhrubai Ambani, right? How many of you know this lady? Yeah, anyone in the audience? She is Jaswanti Ben Jamna Das Popat, the founder of Lijat Papar, right? She was recently awarded, uh, I think, Padma Sri or Padma Bhushan, right? So she started with uh, uh, just a seven or eight people, right? And now everybody, every household must have been tasted Lijat Papar at least once in their life, right? Anyone in this audience uh, able to recognize this person? He is Sridhar Vembu, right? So uh, his, uh, his, the way of living, the way uh, he leads life is really uh, an excellent example. Still uh, living in village and has- he, uh, I think he was an IT person uh, abroad. And mm -hmm. then uh, now he's uh, living uh, in his village and yeah. uh, he's trying that technology there to upgrade the people of the village. Absolutely, right? So uh, it is one of the success stories, I would say very few people might be knowing and appreciating. And he's coming from a very humble family. Sridhar Vembu. Lecture, lecture, lecture. Yeah. Jack Ma, I'm sure uh, all of you must be knowing. He, he, he was not getting even a single job in the market. And right now he's owning Alibaba, right? Now I'm sure you may not have heard about this person. Anyone in this panel? Is Joe Girard, right? Never heard of this person's name also, right? He is the, uh, he is recorded as the most successful person in the world, right? He, he has been recorded in the Guinness Book of World Record in selling uh, the most number of cars, uh, cars in US, right? And if, I, I, I must say that you should search about this person. He's a live, I, I, I mean, means he's one of the best examples I can quote, right? He was not even having uh, money to buy, uh, means uh, dinner or lunch, whatever you can say, right? And he used to do, experimented, uh, was living in, a, I would say, a slum area and used to bo polish boots and from there he became, uh, I would say the most successful person as a salesperson, right? And he has written multiple books after he became successful. He's a real living legend who started from a slum, having very uh, uh, poor uh, academics, right? And that's how he became successful. I'm sure you must be knowing uh, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, right? And again, he, is, he has come from a very humble background. So what is common about these people, right? There are many more leaders you can cite, but I chose them, these people to be on the slide, right? And the reason is uh, they were, they did not had enough money, or I would say they were coming from a very humble background, but still they become, I would say the most successful people, right? So what was common? They were having a clear vision. They used to sacrifice, courageous, disciplined, had a bigger goal, took risks, bring revolution even after failures, right? They stood again. 
Now, nobody had ever imagined that COVID would come and entire ecosystem will fail the way we are we were doing things, right? And one of the badly affected sectors were was the tourism and hospita hospitality sector, right? So there were severe job losses, salary cuts, rampant behavior was become very common thing. You never know who is going to stay uh, the next day or not, right? Everything was going for a toss. A any plan you think and it it will not work, right? Still, Yatra sustained this wave, right? Only few people stayed back. New opportunities were explored at a faster pace. All loopholes in the systems were fixed. All vestiges were cut down. Everyone started owning responsibilities. We invested extensively on a data science, AI, machine learning solutions to automate most of the processes. And as you might be aware, you never know, you might be having a ticket, uh, a flight ticket uh, tomorrow or even today evening and the flights might get canceled. And the call center were bombarded with calls. So the system was not in place to handle such kind of uh, traffic, right? As I said, we fixed old bugs which were lying in the system because nobody cared that uh, we have to fix them. Uh, possibly because everything uh, was going fine and nobody anticipated this kind of situations might occur. So came up strongly with a new business in freight store. So Yatra being primarily in the uh, flights, booking, hotels, booking, holiday booking, now launched a new vertical of in the domain of freights because at that time, uh, shipping systems, again, is still not very easy if you want to... Uh, 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 book a container, uh, uh, right? It, it is still a difficult thing. If uh, I'm sure nobody must uh, in this panel or some, you might have explored that, uh, some of you might have explored that, uh, how to book us um, um, entire cargo system, right? Uh, to ship from one country to another, right? Especially if you are familiar with import export things, right? So motivated people enough to contribute and new leaders started emerging. We identified people whom money was not the motivation to stay. Streamlined various processes, identified areas of wastages. So for example, your cloud systems are running uh, unnecessarily. You, uh, you might be using only for 12 hours. So why not to stop another, the next 12 hours? So these kind of things were identified and we started uh, uh, basically fixing all those loopholes in the system and uh, started saving, right? So a short video on leadership. I'm sure uh, you must have seen this kind of uh, uh, this uh, uh, video, but I thought it would, uh, very would, would be right platform to share, right?
All right. So I hope uh, uh, this was the actually situation that was going on within the company during these times, right? And uh, I found this video very interesting and very relevant because this is the situation we can't take uh, money or time uh, uh, for a toss, right? Uh, we have to utilize every bit of time or money in a proper manner, right? And we have to also identify people who might be less performer, but then you should not, that should, uh, means you should avoid uh, having a, a French or a friend circle, which uh, discusses politics and all those things, right? So, so how to defect, how to lead in difficult times and gain competitive advantage, right? So there would, we started doing several things. Uh, all, all, most of them were on online mode because offices were closed, right? So we inculcated a habit, listen to others and create diversity, remain calm, be ready to lead even in difficult state, keep learning and you have to take care of yourself as well, right? We should have a shared vision, common goal, identify threats and suppressive people, right? Inculcate a habit, be punctual, even if others may not. Once you start doing this, others will join, right? Gradually, everyone will start following. Enforce discipline, right? Give uh, people chance to speak their voice. How would they uh, do in this situation? Let's say if they are a CEO or they are the leader of the company, in that case, what would be uh, the, uh, their opinion? So, so create diversity and try to <clears throat> seek suggestions, right? And you'll have to have extra patience. Most of the people say that, yes, I, I have patience, right? But you need to have extra patience. Take risks, remain confident be optimistic and expect success. Just don't hope that things will become better. In fact, you should work towards achieving this goal. <clears throat> so you have to set an example, right? You inspire them even if they fail to do in their first attempt. Guide your team members or people uh, what kind of courses should they do, take because there are ample of courses and materials available on internet and you would actually uh, get lost uh, in this uh, information bombardment uh, zone. So we should identify the right resources. Focus on time management, have a shared vision uh, <clears throat> and monitor and measure the progress, be a good salesperson, keep learning So you have to also take care of yourself and your team members. So you have to eat less, eat healthy, exercise, meditate, give time to your fam family, keep self-control. Uh, leader's behavior is great, crucial to the success. And you should share whatever you have learned. Give credit to your team members, reward people, appreciate, be humble. And finally, don't try to control others' mind. Now, this was a very basic things that I tried to cover. And uh, uh, we all uh, have learned these things, but when it comes to applying, it becomes very difficult because these are philosophical thoughts. When you start applying, it becomes really challenging. So I would just demonstrate what things we did uh, and what things we planned, executed uh, in a coordinated manner uh, with a less number of resources, 
and without asking people to work overtime. So that was the critical message that was given by the management that you just don't ask people to work overtime. They have to take rest. They have to remain healthy, right? So as I started with the discussion that <clears throat> there was huge bombardment in the call center. So, and you, you don't have money because whoever has holded your money is not going to give you so easily, especially during COVID. This was clearly evident, right? If airline has, uh, uh, I mean, once you book the ticket from any of the OTAs, it, the, some portion of money always goes to uh, the uh, uh, airline company, right? So once there is a request for a refund, there are certain challenges that even Yatra or any company rather would face a similar situation. So we started building a few projects, uh, for example, email bot, right? and then chatbot, interactive voice response system, which was made available on WhatsApp as well. Information retrieval engine for the call center agents and uh, for a support uh, page for uh, our customers so that if they have some basic queries, they can uh, find their answers on the support page itself. Then we started working on discounting, dynamic discounting systems uh, based on the customer segmentation. Some, uh, we had to actually send messages frequently and we were using some third party tools to send uh, SMSs. And as a result, we also built URL shorteners. Uh, we built a few uh, information retrieval tasks based on voice, built recommender system, uh, worked on various reporting uh, dashboards, and we automated most of the data engineering tasks. Now, what kind of technologies and algorithms did we use? Primarily natural language processing, uh, where we used SPACI, NLTK, Stanford NLP. These are too much technical, uh, but I'm just giving you maybe for reference purpose. Uh, we used, started using deep learning, fast text, word embedding, word to vec, LSTM, RNN, CNN in different projects wherever it was required. Predictive modeling regressions, recommendations, speech to text and text to speech. We used a different frameworks like RASA frameworks, Spark NLP, large scale dynamic discounting frameworks were built using mixed integer linear programming. And the softwares that we used were Pymo, Baron, Ciplex, genetic algorithms. We built the chatbot using finite state machines. So I'm just giving you a demonstration that how this works. Let's say somebody is sending an email to the desired uh, email address with a query. Please book a flight ticket from Delhi to Mumbai on 21st September, 2019, right? This is an old video uh, and the person has sent this request to a designated email address. And if it works properly, you will get a response back within a couple of minutes. Now this kind of system was built to ensure that some basic, basic kind of uh, query fetching and sharing uh, some, uh, some kind of itineraries to our enterprise customers, uh, we don't have to involve a human being. So the same thing was handled by human beings. Uh, and it used, if somebody starts uh, seeing the mail immediately and acts, starts acting on that email, uh, then on an average, it used to take approximately 20 minutes. Now this, as you can see, this is an itinerary that has been generated uh, by the system automatically within hardly one minute, right? And the response can be seen on the inbox of the same person. So this was the email that was sent. And as you can see, it hardly took less than two minutes to get a response back. So this was, uh, this started saving huge amount of time and resources, and it was the actual use of uh, machine learning, which started saving huge amount of cost for the company. And this is one of the successful projects that is working at Yatra. Now we also uh, launched a chatbot. So if you have some basic kind of queries, 
then you can use this chatbot available on the website and then some basic chat activities can be done from here though it's not a full fledged uh, 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 dynamic chatbots chatbot uh, that would require huge amount of effort and time and it will and it was not serving the purpose that was actually required so we focused what is required at this point in time so this kind of uh, services helped our customers to get invoice uh, email itineraries right so check the refund status check the cancellation charges so that they don't have to call to the call center so they, the same thing was made available on whatsapp so you can send a, a, a whatsapp chat and you will get give you'll receive the similar kind of uh, interface on whatsapp and the only difference would be you have to press uh, share messages in terms of 1 2 3 4 as the menu options here you can click so this is how chatbot was uh, made uh, live which started helping our customers uh, to basically get basic information from here itself on various channels so that was the chatbot whatsapp bot and similar kind of information was given on the ivr system so if you call to a call center and if you have you are calling from a registered number it will start automatically detecting all your information and will start giving you relevant uh, information that was required to serve automatically without involving a customer agent. <clears throat> and let's say because uh, people can write in various ways, so I won't say it is 100% it works even in if even if the pe person do not write uh, email in a proper uh, format or proper uh, content is written uh, or the content is partial, let's say somebody forgot to mention the return date or let's say somebody forgot to mention uh, the origin because we start thinking that, okay, I'll be traveling to London, but we forgot that I am staying in Delhi, right? Uh, so some, this kind of uh, uh, um, <coughs> errors do people make while sending emails. And in that case, what we used to do, let's say if you are able to detect only the destination, we filled a pre-populated form with the columns missing so that the agents don't have to run, uh, go through the email or, uh, and then the person can actually, uh, 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 be, uh, the agent would basically can fill the incomplete form based on his previous experience or by calling the customer uh, customers directly. And then the same email was generated. Uh, so you do, uh, the agent, uh, will not have to compose that email uh, by hand anymore. So he has to just fill the missing uh, columns and press the submit button. Automatically that email will be sent and saved in the uh, system as well as it will be sent to the customer. So we tried to solve this in multiple phases and uh, that has brought our cost uh, tremendously down. Similarly, we worked on a dynamic discounting framework uh, that started uh, helping us by saving seven to nine percent of uh, discounts. Now, this is Sai Swadhiva. So, this is another uh, demo. Uh, we experimented with this uh, application, Hi, and though How this has been discontinued now. Hi, Uva. Book me a morning Uber flight from Pink City to Delhi for me and my friend tomorrow. Showing results for Jaipur to New Delhi. That's not all. You can also type out your search. Got it. Price sort has been applied. Yuva's smart filters identify your most specific searches as well. You can even give the name of the destination airport. Give it the cheapest flight from Jaipur to IGI airport. You want to change origin city, destination city? Yes. Showing results for Jaipur to New Delhi. You can also ease your search further by stating your budget. Show me non-stop flights ranging between 2500 and 4500. Great, your filter has been applied. You are designed to identify multiple queries at once. It also pauses, modifies or stops your search anytime you want. Modify search. 
Do you want to modify your search? Yes. Which city are you leaving from? Bobby is alive on 15th December with a return on Christmas Eve. Showing result from Mumbai to Chennai. So register today and join the 60,000 counting happy users and let Yuva book your next Yatra. So here uh, uh, we ensured that let's say if somebody is using the word IGI airport. So it means that IGI airport is in Delhi and it detects that same. If you are saying that uh, book me a flight on Christmas Eve, it would uh, basically book your ticket on 24th December. So these kind of uh, things were uh, done to ensure that the customers get a seamless experience. And as you can see, it was working at a very uh, a seamless manner uh, and the response time was just awesome. So this was a huge success, uh, but then this was discontinued because it also used to consume huge amount of resources. And this was just a luxury item. And we, can, we again, as I said, the situation did not permit and data science projects are really costly projects. So. So we had to discontinue or take some kind of steps that would be good for the company, not for what is good for me or good for just for the uh, sake of customers, right? So similarly, various other features were made available uh, on the app where you can search nearest police station, uh, nearest ATM or uh, nearest hotels, having a budget less than 5,000 or a three-star hotel, uh, uh, So it was integrated with uh, uh, Google Maps and uh, the results were extracted again from Google Maps. We also build an uh, in-house database to address these kind of uh, uh, services so that faster results can be Show shown. Having swimming pool. Your preference has been set for hotels with swimming pool radius within one kilometer. So th this, this is showing results where you are standing and you are searching nearby places. has been applied for hotels with swimming pool radius within 5.0 kilometers. Show hospitals within 5 kilometers. Your filter has been set for hospital with radius within 5.0 kilometers. Similarly, different uh, things were built. Uh, for example, customer care knowledge base. This was again designed so that it helps uh, to get what kind of questions people are asking these days. And uh, our interactive dashboard was given and accordingly actions can be taken uh, by the company. Several other reporting mechanisms were also built. Now, if we talk about the preparedness for analytics uh, job market. So job market in AI is huge. So uh, you just need to be very confident. You have to really know things in order to fit yourself in this uh, domain. Uh, you have to continuously upskill. You also need to know the basics. The fundamentals should be very sound. If you really want to enter this field, uh, just don't, uh, if you're really not interested, just don't try to get into this field because it will get, uh, fetch you a higher salary because you will get stuck at one point in time uh, if you are not really interested and you are not willing to devote in upskilling on continuous basis. <clears throat> so consulting firm PwC estimates that AI could contribute up to 15 trillion uh, to the global economy by 2030. Now, what is uh, available in the market? So if, if you are a tech graduate, uh, there are various roles that is available. The data analyst, data scientist, machine learning in, in, uh, engineer, AI engineer, and then 
uh, there are various segments, uh, for example, NLP, speech processing, or image processing, and so on. If you are an uh, MBA graduate and you are looking to enter this field, you should target BI developer, da data mining, or simple basic analysis, or business analyst role, and digital transformation analyst, and product managers. Now, gaps normally that have been found in the candidates uh, based on my experience uh, for the last seven to eight years uh, in data science domain. What I found is that lack of understanding of basics of linear algebra, numerical methods, getting misguided by the buzzwords and certifications. People think that I have got certified from some XYZ Institute, uh, but then you are just carrying another certificate. It hardly makes any difference uh, in the company. If you are really knowing, you don't need certificates at all. So getting lost in technology stacks. There are so many technology stacks coming almost on daily basis uh, that you will surely get lost if you start finding what is good, what is bad, right? So lack of guidance about the bigger picture, lack of collaboration uh, uh, between industry and academia and poor and sluggish programming attitude. You think that I'll become a data scientist without writing a single piece of code, right? That's the biggest mistake that I have found in the people and poor computer science fundamentals and lack of understanding where to apply. What is the problem? Right. <clears throat> so there are many things uh, you can go through it. Uh, lack of passion, lack of ability to find problems that exist in the society. There are thousands of problems in the society itself you can see nearby and just try to identify what is the problem. Don't think that how you are going to apply AI. First, identify the problem. Then you think how this can be solved. Then possibly you will come to a solution that, okay, let's work on computer vision. You may not be knowing what is the computer vision, but if you have identified the problem, then you can start working. There are many platforms uh, uh, that gives you this kind of advantage to contribute on the open source where India is really poor. Uh, so you can start exploring these kind of platforms and start contributing initially, maybe as a, a lay, uh, uh, there are various phases of data science. So you will, once you start going in, entering into that field, uh, then possibly you will start knowing how to apply, where to apply, what to do. And so, <clears throat> so, so, so th that's how, you, uh, thus you will start growing in this field. Now, one of the basic uh, issues that I found that people read blogs. Now that's good to gain an understanding. Uh, but then if you think that you have read one or two blogs on a particular topic and you think that you have become expert in this area, that's the biggest mistake that I have ever found in a candidate. People even are not aware what are the basic books, what are the fundamental books that they should read before read, even reading the blogs or, Blogs can only help you revise the concept. That's not the uh, purpose of reading blogs. Now, how you can overcome these habits? Identify a good mentor, potentially a good researcher or a person from industry. Identify a problem that deserves a solution. Practice programming, participate in forums, if you know an answer, try to write on the Stack Overflow. Somebody might have asked a similar question or you can write your answer, right? So at least don't hesitate in writing an answer or giving an answer. Now listen to various problems faced by people in and around your surrounding. Don't limit yourself to using softwares. So you just don't think that I'll just drag and drop from here and there. I'll use Tableau or let's say a Power BI or let's say any other tool or let's say a Weka kind of tool. And you, you, you start thinking that, okay, I know data science. That these are some of the basic mistakes that uh, people have uh, developed. And the only reason is that it really requires huge amount of effort. And as I said, continuous upskilling is required. Now, what are the areas that uh, is likely to drive in the next six to eight years? Healthcare diagnostics, huge scope. 
agriculture amazing area cyber security just think of any problem and uh, i mean cyber security is one of the uh, i would say the uh, it 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 really requires attention really military warfare music composition film writing film making dialogue writing fashion text summarization speech autonomous vehicles games handling customer care supply chain stock market energy optimization drug design and drug targeting how to target what kind of uh, patient should be given what, what kind of drug should be given to this particular patient so this is again a very huge area especially to treat cancers and some chronic diseases this is an amazing area yeah in smart cities and there are the list can continue right but these are some of the things which i found uh, is likely to grow so if you want to enter into this field you should identify just one or two areas and then deep dive into it and then most likely i'm sure and in fact i am confident that you can get listed just like these people in this the first slide that i showed right this slide and possibly you can see yourself uh, in one of the uh, portraits right something like this uh, in uh, some future talks right and this can only happen if you uh, start working today in a right manner in a right direction so just a minute let me go to that slide right so these are some of the career paths i already mentioned right and that completes my uh, talk for today so thanks if you have any questions i would be really happy to answer them so i won't say anything the forum is open for question and answer session you all can put in your questions in the chat box or unmute yourself and ask hello sir uh, deepak shirsagar uh -huh. uh, so, uh, good afternoon sir sir i would like to know that uh, how sir did uh, ai or uh, data science will help in ma for marketing students for marketing students right so first uh, area so when when you talk about marketing right we have to understand what what we are going to market right and uh, you have to first identify you cannot sell the same product to everyone right so you have to understand this right so it means you have to start, first focus on the customer segmentation what is his purchase pattern right what could be uh, a uh, purchase pattern what would be the range right whether he he, he always books a, let's say for example three star hotel then you in that case you can't recommend a five star hotel to this person let's say somebody is uh, uh, only stays in a five star hotel so you cannot send a maruti 800 to pick him from the airport So, right i hope you understand from this uh, statement that if your your customer is a five star customer then you you have to say sh send let's say for example if you are also working on a cab section cabs area in that case you have to send a premium car more, more, most likely right so you have to understand your customer his buying pattern behavior and uh the frequency and there are many other things right age of the customer and there could be various other factors so same goes with the uh, digital marketing 
whom sh whom should you target you don't have in infinite money to spend uh, to on the advertisement on uh, let's say uh, social media platforms so you have to uh, target your customers that this is the offer that we are going to uh, uh, give for this particular segment of the customer so these things sh should be very uh, uh, means we should be very confident uh, on uh, targeting or doing some kind of digital marketing or physical marketing in fact i can show you one book i just a minute yeah possibly i think i i must recommend this book i hope uh, you are able to see this how to uh, sell yes sir uh, right? screenshot can you see this are you able to read uh, yes yes sir so this how is the same sell. person joe girard which i mentioned in my talk this is a living legend so you should read this book this is an awesome book right so this will tell you how you can now let's say if you are working in a segment for example uh uh let's say which uh, now there is a problem with uh, digital marketing as well right you might see thousands of advertisement on your facebook or instagram or let's say any other channels how many of you remember if it is not shown on your tv and if it doesn't appear on your screen uh, frequently how many you of you are able to recognize the brand if you have seen that once or twice in your life or in the, while while you are browsing your facebook instagram or this kind of platforms possibly the answer is you won't be able to recognize or remember and let's say if you are really serious about making an impact possibly it would be really wise to send a birthday card physically to that person now not that or let's say anniversary card to that person in the house and if you compare the cost that you are going to spend on targeting one person on digital platform and targeting one person on a physical physical manner or the trad traditional manner you will realize the physical part is more effective in this uh, 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 time if you really have limited budget then these kind of strategies can work so there is one more question in the chat box i'll read it out for you is there any chance in data science for a student who is not that much good in numbers see to be very honest uh, 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 the the field is really i would say is really is really requires some kind of rigor right so when you are saying you are not good at numbers why don't you ask that how can you improve yourself that you become good in um, uh, crunching the numbers rather than saying that i can't do it you just change the statement how can i do it and that will change your perspective altogether and you will you will sooner become a, a person that is very good at numbers if you start thinking negatively then there are thousands of negative things that can happen if you start taking things in a positive manner it will be act means entire ecosystem will start supporting you So There's the next question is resources available on the internet you have to just identify some good resources and just stick to that So the next question is mm -hmm. what skills are must to have for a data scientist Okay uh, I have listed many points which I personally found uh uh lacking in the people based on the interviews that I have uh, conducted right uh so there are many skills but then i would say you should be very you you should not run away from coding now that's the basic elementary requirement after all this requires a coding background unless you are going to enter into uh, uh some, something like a data science product manager but then uh, in order to even reach there uh, you you must have some kind of background right 
so uh, coding is must at least it to an elementary level so that you just don't tell that no no uh, my fingers are shaking uh, means i i I'm, I'm not appearing for uh, uh, data science position but i am just uh, want to become a manager then you, it uh, it will become difficult right so i'm i am not here to demoralize i am just trying to show you the phase that is actually expected so if you really want to enter start focusing there is huge amount of F, uh, opportunity but then you have to also uh, as i said you have to keep yourself upskilling continuously at least till a stage when when you become uh, confident and then possibly you can uh, take a break or relax and then maybe again you have to uh, but then uh, even after that you have to uh, still work on the upskilling part so the next question is from uh, dr pallavi mm -hmm. and that will be our last question how ai is giving upper edge to yatra which is its com competitors okay as i said the best uh, uh, i would say uh, i showed you some of the examples right which is live on our system so it means that we tried to save huge amount of cost so right now we are operating at a at a higher efficiency at a less with a less number of resources or human resources right this is how you can uh, basically <laughs> use technology especially ai or let's say any kind of automation so th that uh, gave us an advantage that even if we have less number of people we are able to manage uh, things in a professional manner now the, the the same thing is happening with the other competitors as well so the see, time is not if time is bad for yatra then certainly time is equally bad for any other competitors in the market right but yes using this has helped us to retain our customers retain the faith of our customers in fact we have gained a few customers in this uh, time i uh, hope that uh, uh, gives you an answer So I would like to take this opportunity to thank you. It was indeed a knowledgeable address. So Kick started his session with some interesting pictorial quiz, highlighting some good leadership qualities that are essential in today's dynamic world. So it took us through the journey of Yatra. He stressed on the importance of fixing up the business areas that require immediate attention. He shared his views on process streamlining and the use of motivation for employee engagement. for organizational transformation a beautiful short video was apt with the ongoing discussion highlighting the need of an effective leader so I demonstrated few exam few applications of data science at yatra a company founded in 2000 this online travel service providing company has come a long way and is one of the leading companies in its sector despite the pandemic and the covid impact on the tourism and travel sector the company has been able to strongly come up the ladder and revitalize itself through its resilient strategies by use of data science ai and data analytic applications and most importantly under the able leadership of dr abhay badani thank you sir for enriching us with your words of wisdom thank you I'm sure most of you must have heard about the O Hotel located in our very own city Pune. Well, our next keynote speaker for the day is Mr. Manoj Menon, Vice President Operations, the O Hotel. His entire tenure of more than eight years at the O, Mr. Menon has climbed the corporate ladder while taking up various positions, from starting off as the Director Sales to being the Resident Manager and now the Vice President Operations. he has been instrumental in reviving the business post the german bakery bomb blast having vast experience of more than 30 years in the hospitality industry he is not only responsible for shaping the careers of many sales and front office professionals but also for setting up 14 hotels mainly in the western region of india after completing his degree in post graduate diploma in sales and marketing from symbiosis institute of management pune 
Mr. Menon started his career in the hospitality industry in July 91 by heading the front office and sales at the city's first four-star hotel, the Regency. 2003 onwards, he had a corporate stint wherein he had contributed tremendously towards the sales of renowned organizations like the Concept Hospitality Limited, the Fern and the Orchid among 22 other hotels. Mr. Menon is an active member of Pune Hoteliers Association, Maharashtra Tourism Forum and has also been awarded the Hospitality Superstar by the World Federation of Hospitality Professionals two years in a row. It's a delight to have you here with us, sir. I request Dr. Varda Inamdar, Assistant Professor, DYPIMS, to felicitate Mr. Manoj Menon. I humbly invite Mr. Manoj Menon to shed some light on today's theme. Sir, please unmute yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. Uh, let me begin uh, <clears throat> by addressing uh, the uh, students, the faculty, the very senior uh, people who are on this forum right now. Uh, it's my honor and privilege to address uh, today's session. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, this last two years of the pandemic has taught us a lot of things. What we were not ready for, what we were not prepared for, and now life is changing again. The things are looking up, and I hope the positive results start showing up. Uh, just to give a brief, uh, we started, uh, the, just a moment, yeah, just put this off, sorry, I've been with the O Hotel, O Hotel is a, a typical city hotel, a five star business class hotel, uh, very unique, very unique in shape and design, and uh, it was launched with an idea of catering to corporate as well as leisure destination people. Now, <clears throat> To just tell you about the uh, typical trends that we've been following, everything is a learning experience. So there's no set principle ever since uh, the COVID has happened. Earlier, and I'm sure that most of you will agree, there was a typical boom in uh, the hospitality sector. We last five to eight years, you could say eight years to be precise, we saw big brands coming into Pune. Uh, mainly Marriott spreading out its wings with different forms, taking over the Starwood uh, group of hotels. And so many five-star hotels suddenly. Now, when I started my career in 91, we just had one five-star hotel in the city and that was Blue Diamond, which was eventually taken over by Taj and later again, renamed as Taj Blue Diamond again. So the shift that I've seen, I've seen, I've been very fortunate to see uh, in the 90s, the industrial revolution, uh, later on in the 90s, the IT revolution, and then now what we're seeing as the social revolution. So I've also been fortunate to see the growth of Pune as a automobile hub, as an IT hub, uh, been actively involved in sales, meeting so many different people, different types of companies, trying to generate business for the company. Then coming into Fern, I had so many hotels to be launched in the city, outside the city, in the Western zone. So I've been fortunate to launch resorts, apartment hotels, five-star hotel, four-star, so different categories. And I learned through that entire process. Now, to tell you the last eight years, as I said, the boom was such that we could also see the emergence of something like a Balewadi High Street. Earlier, if you meant a restaurant bar, you meant a discotheque, you had to come to Koregaon Park. Today, you go to Ratne, there is a whole lot of restaurant bars. You go to Balewadi, it's, it's unique in its own way. Then you have another place uh, just behind Sheraton Hotel, which has come up with different types of restaurants. Even the restaurant bars have typical names. You can't even guess it's a restaurant bar anymore, like a two BHK, one BHK. And you think, what is it? It's a restaurant bar. It's got a lovely discotheque. It's got a lovely DJ playing. It's got a different types of food to serve you. Same thing goes, you come to Viman Nagar. It's like a cow gully. So many emergence of so many restaurant bars, discotheques, and right inside the mall, outside the mall. So the emergence was 
such that you know everyone and anyone wanted to try their hand into hospitality uh, either they were getting into restaurant business they were getting into restaurant bar business or they were looking at opening hotels in collaboration with well established brands so that's how you see for example if you see the marriotts majority of the marriott hotel in pune is owned by panchil group they are construction people you look at o hotel uh, it's a uh, construction company oxford group but the first uh, hospitality venture started with o pune and then we came in goa we came up with a beautiful golf resort if i'm if i can uh, talk about it it's uh, well nestled in between uh, flame academy symbiosis so it's a beautiful uh, location well adopted for weddings big launch programs a huge uh, you know theme based uh, events can be held there so coming to the trends that we followed uh, just a moment i have to take this call sorry okay uh, now going by the trends that we followed we were totally not ready for what happened uh, we were doing fantastic business the, the there was a boom uh, with the automobile sector coming in i am sure uh, if some of you are aware of what kind of occupancies most of the hotels did we had a lot of expats in pune uh, there was an emergence of uh, indo japanese indo korean indo german companies that had come into pune city especially in the mdcs of chakhan urse talegaon uh, pimpri chinchwad uh, shirwal so there are too many companies the world renowned companies coming in which were catering to the automobile sector and almost every hotel had long stay foreigners i was fortunate to have around 27 of them and uh, jan the pandemic was declared and we could see the sudden decline in business coming up all of us thought that okay it might be a one month or two month uh, procedure we'll have to follow just listen to what the government says and you know things will be back to normal but unfortunately it started the pandemic just started spreading out and uh, 20th of march 2020 we had to take a decision to close the hotel so we had to request our guests to check out and you know make alternate arrangements to go back to their country because we were sure that once it's a uh, lockdown they will get stuck and the decision taken by us some of the hoteliers told that you have made a wrong decision of uh, closing down the hotel you should keep it open but my decision was like why should i keep it open when i don't have business i can't have business i can't take business so we had closed it down and like us couple of hotels also closed down for example arvatas sagar plaza central park the uh, crown plaza lemon tree so it was a new learning then ki how do we handle this now because we had so many we had around 250 staff working for us now more than 50 of them are from outside pune we had arranged accommodation for them they would stay here we had the spa students the spa students i mean uh, we also had the trainees in spa we had a full fledged spa where the girls most of them are from manipur how do we send them back so it was a big challenge that how do we take care of the staff because this happened so suddenly guest yes we told them we are closing down so they could make arrangements to go back but suddenly from cloud 9 we were down and we were now thinking how do we go about it and all the hoteliers were talking to each other trying to understand what do we do and uh, there was this uh, very serious uh, note from the uh, uh, from the government that you can't go out and people staff were not able to go back we had to make alternate arrangements in the hotel to keep them here we had to make arrangements for their meals we had to make arrangements for their medical facilities all of a sudden everything just turned around so it was totally sh shut march went like that with no further instructions coming in april a new trend of business came in where everything was shut there was no way that we could earn money and there came a circular uh, request from the collector office from uh, the medical fraternity to allow doctors and nurses to be housed in the hotel so that they would be uh, they were catering to all the sudden influx of patients that had come in the covid jumbo facilities were being introduced uh, doctors and nurses had to be put up somewhere so that accounted for something new we had to do which we were never prepared for that is sanitizing the entire floors sanitizing the entry points sanitizing the luggage sanitizing the staff taking temperature checks everything just turned around we, it was something new every day we were learning something new 
and the fear factor came in because someone you knew got infected someone you know was on the ventilator and we were only praying that none of our staff none of our team members because we were with makeshift accommodation in the hotel with most of the staff so we were like scared that if one of them gets positive it would hamper and there was no way that uh, hospitals had beds with them so it was very difficult time and the trend was okay wait and watch and suddenly a new set of uh, uh, series of uh, instructions started coming in from the hotel federation where we were invited today two o'clock there is a webinar on how to handle the key speakers will be so and so so and so from the fraternity so and so from the travel industry so and so from the chemical and uh, pest control industry so they were all giving ideas there was too much of knowledge coming in there was so much of uh, inputs coming in that ultimately it got confusing now whom do we listen to because everyone said ek do hafte ka baat hai one month and you know everything will be back most of the senior managers uh, mds chairman of different hotel groups are very confident that it is just a short term uh, and by may june everything will be okay but april also went in like that and uh, there was no way that we could get in touch with our corporate there was no way because there, there was no travel nothing was happening so it came into a mode where you know we had to motivate each other it came into a depressing mode because we were all doing fantastic business suddenly we were sitting with zero revenue and then comes the shocker because every hotelier was talking to each other what would be the salaries now how do we take care of the salaries how would we take care of the staff who are in house those some who had to be uh, who were asymptomatic so they had to be taken care of how do we handle it how do where does the money come from then came may month and we were uh, allowed to travel by taking a gate pass from the police we had to send an sms we would get a pass only then we could visit the hotel there are instances where the hotel staff were also beaten up by getting out of the hotel trying to serve the guests who were staying outside trying to send out some food but we were not allowed to move around so that was a very depressing phase and we were wondering that how do we come out of this and may 23rd uh, the directive came in that some flights were uh, able to operate the hotels were told that you could work on a limited time frame you could work with all the sanitizations and all other precautions that you have to take several webinars were held by the federation by the hoteliers association on how to take care even then we decided we will not open till the time that the common public is able to move around till the time that corporates can move around and we can get some business because there was no way that you would get business with that scenario that was there where nobody could move around the worst part for the hotel industry at that period was april may and some days of june are typical wedding dates for marwadis sindhis and most of the indian weddings are held in these months we lost all those bookings not only me almost all the good hotels had big big business and that losses cannot be termed uh, in in money just like that you know i can say one month i lost more than 70 lakhs of business and there is somebody like a bigger hotel like a red carlton or a jw who lost crores because if you see the trend last few years everybody likes to hold their weddings or big events at hotels because everything is taken care of and it has become a trend now to host weddings big events at only hotels so it's easier there is no other hassle the hotel takes care of everything suddenly we were sitting on blank dates there were some guests who were worried because they had their mohurat dates they had to come to us to ask us how do we uh, make the changes how do we do these and with several follow ups with the government a circular came in okay you can do the wedding for 25 people you can do the weddings for 50 people the certain restrictions were removed but an indian wedding is not possible with 25 people or a 50 people and uh, definitely not when you have a large hall and just 50 people so it's a loss of revenue for the hotel as well so the new trends came in the hotel would say okay minimum we will charge you this much this is how we will uh, provide you the services this is how we will serve you the buffet was separated out keeping social distancing in mind we had to keep every guest who checked in we had to check their temperature we had to note down in the register because every time a pmc health officer would come to check whether we are following all the uh, protocols that are given to us 
we had to keep sanitizer at the entry point at the banquet entrance at the buffet counters so that we don't come into the negative because we heard of some sad news that some hotel ex hotel was charged 2 lakhs as penalty because they didn't follow the rule another hotel charge 1 lakh another resort charge 5 lakhs so you know it gets even more uh, worryful and uh, difficult to understand yeah, how do we handle all this and uh, some of the guests they just coolly shifted their wedding dates to november december but those who wanted to do for a 200 people 300 people they ended up doing for 50 people so that's big loss of revenue again again uh, it became a trend that we can't call everyone because of the restrictions only close family members are called and it came to a stage where it was accepted nobody felt bad ki, okay he's not called because only hotel is allowed to only take 50 people as things went by june july it looked like okay things can get better things will improve and slowly uh, some of the restrictions were taken off and we could see that uh, some you know movement had started so the entire exercise started again and the whole period the worst thing that ever happened to hospitality was lo losing talent losing good staff because when the staff kept waiting and when we could move them after the restrictions were moved in the last week of may we could send back most of our staff home we could give them just monthly for survival whatever we can give because salaries was definitely not going to be possible without income there was no way there were certain uh, survival benefits given to all staff including seniors but otherwise it was a very difficult period and everyone kept saying ki sir how do i survive without a salary so that was a very depressing uh, period for the hospitality where everybody wanted to be safe everybody wanted the job also to be there and salaries also to continue but there was no business and uh, july we saw some trend of uh, movement some business picking up some uh, future bookings coming in and couple of companies calling in this is where we saw the uh, segment like if i if i am sure most of you understand the hotel uh, language uh, the sources of business for a city hotel or the segment of business that we get in is uh, majorly corporates we have the otas that is uh, like a yatra.com uh, make my trip uh, you have TripAdvisor also giving you business. You have Agoda. You have different forms. We realize now these are the kings. We'll have to be good to them because uh, there there is nobody else who can give business. So the uh, immediate reaction was that okay, let's get in touch with all these OTAs. Let us get in touch with all the web portals who can generate business for us because there was nobody else who could give you business. So every hotelier wanted to have a good share and uh, definitely they work on a commission so we had to redo a lot of activities to start generating some business from these portals our own website had to be enhanced we had to make changes there we had to put in some discounts we had to put in some additional amenities to attract people to come to the hotel now the worst part that happened in this period not only losing talent most of the staff went back home because they wanted to be safe at their hometown some of them lost hope that they were, you know, three, four months sitting at home. They started looking for alternate jobs. Some started home cooking. Some started some small restaurant. Some started selling sanitizers, masks, and the, all those kind of PPE kits and things like that to survive. And you feel sad because there were so many of them. I have I've seen GMs, FNB managers, very senior managers starting home cooking business, tying up with Dunzos. Swiggy, Zomato, and the other uh, people who deliver at home. I, I've known of very senior managers where they started this home cooking business or baking business and they were trying to do business just for survival. So it was very, very sad to see very, very senior hospitality people struggling to come out of this. And with no certain date, when hotels will start full fledged when we will start getting that kind of business and when we'll come back to where we were like a city average city hotel a five-star hotel like mine 100 plus rooms we do more than two crores of business a month and here we were looking at whether even we'll do 20 30 lakhs of business which is good enough to pay basic salary to people because that was the situation so it was very sad and very difficult and with no support and with the main team if you are aware that uh, we uh, the, a typical hotel consists of different departments that 
run the hotel smoothly, starting with front office. Here in this pandemic, all we had was the security department surveying the outside and inside of the hotel. We had uh, the cleaning team to make sure that everything is clean, all the touch points are kept clean and nice, even when there were no guests. The worst part where the hotels learned what was important was investing in pest control. Because when the hotel was closed, typically there were pests entering the hotel through drains, through gaps in the entrances. They were destroying furniture, they were destroying cables, they were destroying software. So it was really sad and I know of some hotels, I don't want to name them, but they lost heavily with big, big rats coming in and uh, cockroaches roaming around. They spoiled the furniture, they spoiled the entire infrastructure was damaged because they just kept security to take care of the hotel. They didn't keep anyone to get the hotel clean from inside time to time, nor did they emphasize on the pest control part. So this was another learning that we got that when we keep it closed, it's not only on saving on electricity and other aspects or the cost of salaries, but it's also maintaining the building. And that was a huge learning experience. And thankfully, I never ran into any bad issues because our pest control was very much in touch with us. The sanitization team was very much with us. And we had very limited staff. Now, the other aspect is loss of job, even of my uh, outsourced security team. I had to keep my staff also happy, give them also some source of income. My drivers got converted as security guards so that when there is no guest, there is no driving, they don't have salary. But when they were doing security duty in shifts, each one made sure that they got some job to do and some salary coming in. So we had a team, big team, but we had to divide them into you know, 15 days, you do the job, 15 days, he'll report on the job. And you know, somehow their house will run, but they will not be without salary. So we had to make shift uh, security arrangements. Uh, same goes with the housekeeping team. Uh, we had to divide the 28 people into you know who will come for one week, who will come for the next one week. And we had to do duty rotas. And when we were not allowed to travel, myself and uh, some of my HODs, we made sure that every second day we took a police gate pass just to come talk to the team, motivate them, spend time with them in the building, roam around the hotel, take a survey of everything is kept clean and nice and make sure that there are no pests in the hotel. And we would spend time with them, eat food with them, cook with them and spend time so that they remain motivated and you know continue doing the job because the whole time the poor fellows were all here. And extremely difficult even in uh, summer because the AC plant was shut. And they had to make shift, uh, you know, with the makeshift accommodation, they had to make arrangements for keeping themselves with the fan, with temporary light arrangements. So it is very sad when I recollect all that, uh, you know, it becomes very difficult to imagine. This was something that uh, no hotelier had even planned or thought about, that something like this can happen. I'm, I'm sure I'm not trying to depress you all, but this was uh, the reality. Uh, not many people know because every hotel looks nice from outside. Everything looks so shusha and nice, so glamorous. But the actual problems, what we go through, especially still, it is not over yet. Uh, we're still struggling for the kind of business we used to do. And uh, we are just learning from every day. Now, that typical period, it taught us the importance of the human relationship, the uh, motivational aspect, the staff engagement activities that we need to uh, do on a regular basis. The worst part, and the best part, we had most of our staff covered under medical insurance. So when there were some cases where they were asymptomatic, they had to be uh, at home, isolated. We could take care of their expenses because they were covered under medical. The very junior staff, they were covered under ECIC. So ESIC, so they were also taken care of. So my HR would coordinate. So this is something that was also good because most of the, some of the hotels I heard of staff, there was absolutely no support from management or no medical coverage at all. So that came as a shocker because after that, hotels made it a point to start investing in these things to take care of the staff. Now, that is a time when slowly hotels started opening up. Now, some of the hotels also had these doctors and nurses, so they had to close down totally after that team had checked out, redo 
sanitize the entire hotel premises and then keep it open for public because it was giving negative pub publicity that this hotel had isolated or this hotel had doctors and uh, nurses staying here this uh, this hotel had uh, been catering to isolated uh, patients so we should not use this hotel because it's not clean or it's not safe so that fear factor was there so that uh, i don't know if any one of you has seen but last year when hotel started opening up everyone was making videos with a gm taking a uh, walk around through the hotel and showing you how they are maintaining the hotel how the touch points are being cleaned how the guests are checked in how there is an acrylic sheet on the reception so there is no direct facing the guests how there is pointless uh, without any uh, check in procedure in writing how the guest was uh, taken to his room the other fact was that we could not take the luggage of the guest to the room uh, the guest had to take it himself he couldn't be given valet service they had to park their own cars all these new trends came in some of the guests would get angry why should i pick up my own luggage and we had to tell them sir this is the covid prot uh, protocol given by the government we can't enter your room you have to check in on your own we'll help you here so you know the, the, his keys uh, any document he gave us like an aadhar card for a check in we had to put it into the infrared machine get it sterilized and then give it back to him so when i imagine all these things it was so difficult to you know for the guest also to accept that he has to wait for going through all this procedure same was with us for us to make sure that the guest feels safe and secure and that he is in good hands so this was the one trend that came in till the hotel started opening up fully then came diwali time and things started looking up uh, booking started picking up travel started picking up corporate movement started happening wedding started happening and december started happening in a nice way new year also went in smoothly and the worst part came in again in march 21 where we heard a lot of news about uh, remdesivir shortage the oxygen shortage and lot of people dying i lost uh, even my good neighbors very young people who passed away at that critical time again a scary time for the hotel industry when it was just setting foot we had to close down again there was no way that we could take a risk there was acute shortage of medical facilities of oxygen of plasma you name it and it was a tough time for us and to imagine a, a typical hotelier who is always used to getting busy from morning to evening sitting at home just wondering what to do because there is nothing to do so again bad situation again the market just collapsed the economy wasn't uh, helping us in any way the hospitality took a large beating same went with the travel agencies went with the airlines uh, horrible situation for everyone to imagine and this business after july august again started looking up thankfully the death rate went down the vaccination drive was more successful at that time so we could see some more movement from corporates and things started looking up in this whole period when we realized now how do we uh, bring people back so we had to look at new sales and marketing strategies and the sad part is the entire sales team of any hotel were not available or asked to be on hold or asked to take a break or do anything else because they were not required at that moment there was no business coming in there was no corporate events happening so the sales team what would they do they had nothing else to do or they were called to do multitasking they were helping out in food and production department they were helping out in food and service department they were helping out at front office and it was a sad state of affairs for the sales team uh, most of the hoteliers will agree with me it was a sad story they had to do multitasking even today we are doing multitasking still uh, all the hotels are not operating with full strength so it it is again another learning experience ki tujhe sales ke alawa aur kya aata hai so we had to ask him okay what else can you do otherwise you sit at home no salary nothing if you can do something if you can multitask at least you are taken care of your basics are happening so that that trend was bad no regular sales and marketing activities were happening no hoardings no advertisements were happening yes but something new happened the digital media social media campaign came up in a big way for the hotel industry starting with everyone making videos to show how they are taking care of the guest how they are uh, taking care of uh, the protocols how they are managing everything small small videos everyone would show uh, on their website 
and they would send it out as WhatsApp uh, videos to show their prospective customers or their existing customers how they are following all protocols and taking care of them. And then why it is safe to stay in XYZ hotel because everything is taken care of. Then came the trend. Every hotel was trying to generate some business. You heard of five-star hotels doing food parcels. Uh, that's something unheard of. You have definitely have takeaways. You don't have somebody coming to a five-star hotel to pick up a, a packet of food like a Irani cafe or a, a roadside restaurant or a good restaurant where you have a parcel section, you go and pick up. But unheard of a five-star hotel. Five-star hotels or even came down to selling liquor because those days liquor was difficult. So they were trying to give delivery. I, I have also received WhatsApp messages of five-star hotels delivering liquor with a special discount and delivery if there is X amount of liquor purchased. So food parcels, liquor, then another trend came in since we couldn't sit in the restaurant more than 50% capacity. Hotels, mostly the five-star hotels, started renting out their presidential suites, their big suite rooms for private get-togethers, small get-together, birthday parties. So this was another trend that came in which never existed in the past. No one thought of how to evade the, the social distancing or how to you know make some uh, new way of earning money from group bookings because group was not allowed so this trend also came in where a sweet room was allotted and uh, food was served there and the exclusive service was given there so this one trend we got to see social media became the most effective form of advertising for all the hotels they started clicking very good pictures they started inviting influencers they started inviting bloggers to write about the hotel, even bloggers would show how when they enter, how their uh, sanitization is taken care of, how the temperature check is done, how the chef and uh, people were taking the orders. It's again, it came down to QR code, unheard of in the hotel industry. If a guest says, Ki, I want to order something, we had to show him a QR code. He has to scan it, then go through the menu and tell us what he wants. So he can't be given a regular menu card. So that was another learning experience another trend even today we are following that we're not giving the uh, printed menu card we are still following the qr code and that same applies for the room guest as well now someone who's not technologically savvy or someone who's not so much used to using the android phone or the smartphone gets pretty irritated Are bhaiya, yes, mujhe nahi dekhna hai. tell me what is there to eat he, he, the guest would throw tantrums and it is becoming extremely difficult uh, even today uh, when we we have restrictions because of the protocols that we follow, that our guests can't pick up anything from outside and bring into the hotel because of the sanitization and other things that has to be taken care of. So they end up fighting with us. And this trend where today also when you say, sir, I'm not supposed to come with your luggage straight into your room, he would start making a noise. I'm paying so much. Why can't you give me service? And we have to tell them, Are kaan hai COVID? Kuch nahi abhi. So you know, it's very difficult. Some of them, especially the Bombayites that we have seen, they just don't worry about the mask. So we had, when we stop them, they get irritated, they feel offended, their ego comes up, they say, Ki, Mujhe to kisi ne nahi roka. why are you stopping me? Why are you asking compulsing, you know, asking me to compulsively follow all this? So that's another one. We have to keep our cool, we have to explain to guests the importance of it. And especially educated guests, it becomes very difficult to convince them why they should say simply follow the simple, simple uh, protocols of uh, COVID. But it's difficult and it's still not improved. We're still finding it tough. There are some who listen and some who don't. And then we have to, like, you know, like small school children, we have to tell them, sir, please, we, we, unless you wear it, we won't allow you to check in. So that's another learning experience. So social media, bloggers, influencers, presence on Facebook, presence of Instagram became the rule of the day. Suddenly, these were things that we had to do to have an upper edge on our competition. The worst part is ethics, the simple business ethics that hotels followed. Like if you're a five star, you don't sell a room below X rate. But suddenly we were seeing hotels, especially on Nagar Road, especially the new ones like a lemon tree or a crown plaza. They would sell very, very cheap just to survive. You can't blame them because most of them are franchisee hotels. They have international brands. Owners are a localite or a local builder. The money has to come in. So they were told that, Kuch bhi karo, becho, but room khali nahi jana 
So we had a tough time when a guest would come in and say, oh, but the X hotel on Nagarod is giving me at this rate. Why are you selling at 4,000? So I have a threshold. I have a marketing strategy that I don't sell my hotel less than 3,800 rupees without a breakfast. And somebody would show me a 2,200 rate he's getting from a five-star hotel on Nagarod. So it becomes very difficult to explain to him that why we don't do what they are doing. We made sure that we don't compromise on the class of guests who come to us. We didn't want to compromise. We didn't want to take in the wrong people by selling cheap. Because when we saw that, when we reduced the price less than 4,000, there were different categories of guests coming in, which we didn't want. We had to stop them. We had to restrict them on all platforms, like our own website, uh, OTA platform, that we had to tell them that we don't want these kind of guests coming in. So we had to maintain that. So that meant we didn't do big business like the others, but we did quality business. So that was another uh, learning experience. Say, okay, we are getting uh, to kind some kind of business, but this is the restrictions. These are the class that we have to maintain. So overall, I have never come through such a stage uh, in my entire career where you know we had to be happy even if one or two guests came in from a corporate and we would be so thrilled. Are yeah, so and so guest has come finally. He's come after one year. And uh, guest also wonders why is he made to feel like a king because we send him some cookies and we send him some amenities other than his normal uh, book and he starts uh, feeling here, wow, I'm being taken care of. And we tell him, welcome, nice to see you back after a year or after one and a half years. So the excitement of the corporates coming in is different. As a city hotel, uh, even though you have various sources of business, various class of people coming in, you're always happy when you have a consistent form of business and consistency comes from corporates. So if I say 100 out of 100%, 80, 85% of my guests are corporates, I'm happy because there is customer retainership, there is customer loyalty, there is ample opportunity for me to give back my regular customer. That since you've been with us, that opportunity was lost during the pandemic because you had a non-loyal guest coming in only because he got a better rate that day on the system from the OTA or from some platform because of which he came to my hotel. He did not come because he genuinely liked the hotel. He just came because he got it cheap for that day. So I can't expect loyalty or repeat business from him or referral business from him. Yes, I do have the opportunity to give him a world-class service that he will remember and then tell her, but the hotel is extremely good. So that opportunity also came in during the pandemic. We got to get new faces. We got to meet prospective customers whom we could turn around, who came in as a one time just to see because he got it cheap on some platform. And we could turn it around and we could make him a loyal customer or we could get more business out of him. So these are a lot of learning experiences that has come in during this pandemic. I'm sorry if I have uh, started off with all the sad story, but that is the actual story that's happening. And uh, this November, December was extremely good for the hotel industry all over India extremely good pickups, a lot of weddings happened because 50% capacity was allowed. So a lot of new uh, things we got to do, a lot of new events happened. Uh, this is typically the time when hotels benefit from the launches, like you know, insurance policies, mobiles, laptops, electronic gadgets, um, the facility management, the HR associations, they do a lot of activities. And this is what we want because this is what helps us survive with the dignity that we also deserve because they also end up giving good rates not unlike the pandemic and the uh, desperate situation where you sell it whatever it is to just survive going by uh, the other trends i've just written down something so that i don't forget as i can see i can tell you all it's nothing depressing going forward Yes, January was bad. It was, again, a little bit of a disaster, but not very, very bad. It was still okay because we could survive. February has started off well, and I am confident if the international travel starts in, uh, the international flights start coming in, you will get back those Europeans, the US guys, the uh, Germans, the Koreans, the uh, Japanese who have their companies here, who come here for long stays, and we benefit. And not only that, India is a huge tourist destination for all of them. As I said, I'm also a part of the Tourism Forum of Maharashtra because we realize that a lot of uh, states do good campaigns for marketing their state to attract tourism. But Maharashtra didn't have much of it. So I'm actively involved in that to try and bring more uh, guests 
coming into Maharashtra because we have a lot of heritage. We have a lot of old, uh, you know, forts and uh, places of tourist interest. If you look at Maharashtra, except snowfall and sands, we have everything else in Maharashtra. So I'm sure once the normal uh, travel starts, we will see a boom coming in. We will see the good times coming in and a lot of good things will happen. And I would request you also, uh, apart from, I say this to everyone, let's not spend when we have the time and the money to go on a holiday. Please don't go abroad for another two years. Spend your money in India. Go to places in India. There are a lot of places in India to see. Spend that holiday money in India. That's how you can help hospitality. You can help the entire travel and uh, the tourism sector. There are beautiful places in India to go. You want snowfall, go to the north. Please don't go abroad. You want to do a lot of uh, sightseeing. There are plenty of things. You see Uttarakhand. You see uh, Gangtok, Imphal. You go to Karnataka, beautiful places in Karnataka. Apart from, we all know Goa. Everybody loves Goa. Kerala, Gujarat. But there's plenty to see. And we Indians can help each other, especially this sector, the hospitality, tourism, and travel trade. Only we can help. We don't need to depend on outsiders. We have a very good population, a very good sizable population who go on vacations every year without fail. Let it be summer. Summer is a huge uh, travel time for Indians. Same goes with the festive time during Diwali and uh, others. So this, I would say, please encourage your, your parents, your friends that spend money on vacations in India travel next one and a half, two years. We don't have to depend on any international aid. We don't have to depend on anybody else. We can do it ourselves. We can promote our country. We can promote our tourist destination and bring up the hospitality sector. I'm sure we can ourselves do this for us and you know not depend on anyone else. So I would say one uh, learning experience from all this, that it taught the hospitality sector, it taught the travel tourism tech sector also, that when the going is good, please invest in your team, please invest in your staff, give them the proper medical facilities, not just gifts, recognitions, awards and appraisals, but there is something, keep aside money for their welfare, that is medical facilities. This pandemic has all taught us that why an insurance is a very important feature in our lives. A lot of people do not insure themselves. I'm telling you all, please spend adequate time in understanding this. Because when you tomorrow become an entrepreneur, when you become directors or you become senior management, you should take care of your team because if your team is good, you're good. I have, I have made this a policy during the pandemic that all my team gets medical coverage and they are taken care of. So. I, I would insist that, you know, this is also another aspect that we should look at. First, I told you about the holidays. Please spend it in India. Second, please take care. If you don't have facilities, medical facilities, you don't have insurances, please do it. Because the pandemic has taught us that there is nobody to help you when things are down. But if you are insured, if you are taken care of your own uh, requirements, it has helped you survive. The other part, the learning experience that came in is that when we are doing good, keep aside some money as a corpus for any eventuality, because none of the hotels were prepared. They could manage to give some part of the salary for one month, two months, three months. After that, they sent out letters to the staff saying that we are not in a position to pay all anything. There cannot be anything that can be done from the hotel side. You are free to look for a job. You're free to do your own business or whatever, and we will call you when the hotel reopens. And that also, in case there is a requirement, because we will be running with basic staff, we won't require all the staff. In this case, what does the staff do? So I would urge that this becomes very important that you know we keep aside some money every month as a corpus, build it up, keep it for staff welfare and any eventuality, at least for a few months, that money can be divided, a basic survival money can be given, and you know the hospitality team can be taken care of. So this is something that I also thought of, and we started this, practicing this. Now, when you look at the emerging trends, uh, what we see now, <coughs> a lot of hotels are now investing in uh, social media is one, 
secondly doing these video ads doing uh, you know giving offers additional benefits on their own web portals that's the new trend i have seen the other trend that i have seen emerging right now is most of the hotels looked out spend time in finding out who can be the prospective customer in times of lockdowns in times of bad uh, you know calamities like this or a natural calamity like this or a pandemic the armed forces their work never stops apart from we all went to hospitals we all went to medical uh, institutes we went to pharma companies asking for business when there was nobody else traveling but the armed forces they were working they were supporting they were really supporting everywhere you name the army they were supporting even in the pandemic they were supporting with medical facilities they were traveling so they needed hotels they needed their own facilities to be maintained and some hotels benefited they gave very special rates are they survived because of armed forces business they survived because of medical uh, faculty business they survived because of doctors and nurses business so that was something that also taught us okay let's look at these aspect we ignored we we never really actually chased the armed forces for the business but the army you name it anywhere and everywhere they are there to help the government they are always there in natural calamities and pandemic we saw how they helped out so they also required that help and it was one way of giving it back to them gratitude so we could start that business as well during these bad days when corporate is not traveling we are approaching armed forces to get that kind of business that we can you know survive and also take care of them and earn some gratitude in return and you know give show our gratitude as well now recognizing these trends we have also decided that uh, we will go with what the new trend is and the new trend is that the youth crowd what we have seen you have a good restaurant you have good music you have good food the youth crowd is the one that comes in more compared to what we have seen typical family crowd coming in uh, in the past so that's one attraction that's there because they come in numbers they come in good numbers so that's a new trend we have seen in fnb service we have seen in the restaurant business uh, attracting the youth crowd uh, making specially menus for them and we have also seen the trend when we do live cooking in front of them they are very much happy to see how their food is being like for example my restaurant has a wood fire oven so you can see how your pizza is being made a thin crust pizza you can watch it the same goes with my japanese restaurant uh you can sit at the sushi counter and watch and we have seen the youngsters they like it they like seeing how their food is being done and what is the other trend we all do this nowadays before we eat when the food is served we want to click a picture wait 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 let me click a picture instantly within 2 minutes instagram facebook everyone knows where you are and your friends oh wow cool and then you are showing pictures of you know how the food is being made you are showing live streaming of how it is so this is the trend unfortunately we have to accept it because that's how people nowadays are they they are not worried about khana garam kyun nahi they are worried about ki presentation acha ho uske pehle pictures nikalo videos nikalo dosto ko batao kahan par hai and show that you know so this is another trend that we have to adopt because we were not we have not done this before we have never had that kind of crowd we, when it's a five star hotel people assume are bahut mehanga hoga so the youth crowd to forget it they will never come it's the middle mid upper middle class and you know senior management level of corporates who would come for entertainment or whatever so today we are seeing the new trend where the youngsters come in so it's a welcome change it's a welcome change so that's the new uh, the new trend that we see now the prospect is uh, for the hospitality wait uh, let the corporate movement start i think uh, by march we should and all those who look at the uh, hospitality industry as a career i would say don't lose hope on uh, your dreams if you wish to or you desire to come into this industry please do so it's got tremendous growth coming in it is some in, it is one industry that can never die it can never lose hope it's always positive and you have that resilience and that you know that positive approach you will see people you will not see hotelier sulky you will see them happy waiting at the lobby you will see them waiting at the entrance welcoming guests more than happy to go out of their way to help guests 
wanting to do extraordinary to give that experience to the guests. So this is one industry that can never go down. It will always have a bright future. Yes, last one and a half years has we have seen very bad times, but definitely it will bounce back, and I'm sure it will bounce back in a very big way. And uh, I'm positive about it. So if anybody wants to ask me anything, anybody want, wants to meet me, you're more than welcome. I'm uh, except Sunday, I'm always there. You can always uh, come and meet me if you want to know more about this industry, if you want to see what are the career prospects, if you want to see what are the best you can do, uh, irrespective of what, you're, uh, what, you're, what is your education right now. There is something for everyone at the hospitality industry. So you're more than welcome to come and meet. You have any doubts, you want to ask me something. I'm done with what I could say. I never uh, write down. I normally just say from my heart. So what I felt, what I've experienced in the last one and a half years is what I came across. Uh, I put it forward to y'all. So anybody wants to ask me anything, please do. The forum is now open for question answer session. Y'all can ask your questions via the chat box or otherwise y'all can even unmute yourself and question. Ashutosh, uh, I think your question is what is the duration? Now, duration is something that uh, none of us can predict. It's been quite uncertain. But uh, I feel that another three months, uh, there will be a definite growth uh, once the international flight started and once our corporates start moving. Because we are blessed with enough corporates in Pune City. When I say corporates, it's a mixture of uh, engineering, manufacturing, IT, pharma, insurance and mobile company. So these are the ones who generate revenue and a lot of business that comes in from the insurance sector, which are extremely uh, doing well as of now. Okay. So I can't tell you of time frame, but I look at the mid 2022 as the change of changes will happen. Things will grow. Thank you. Ma'am. Sir, good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Pavin Nayak. I'm speaking from Kalburgi, Karnataka. Sir, okay. how many of your staff have taken this as an opportunity to enter into entrepreneurship or the kind of those things? And uh, what percentage uh, has once again come back to you for jobs? Uh, see, to tell you frankly, when we restarted, since business was very, very low, we were single digit figures in occupancy with literally no uh, restaurant business, no banquet business. Instead of 256 staff that I had, we were operating with 44 staff. And when the protocols were changed, when we were allowed to take banquet bookings, when we could take weddings, we could take big uh, programs, exhibitions, we brought up the staff to uh, 75 people. And when things improved, we brought them up to 94. Now telling you, uh, to tell you frankly, most of my good talented staff have either opted for alternate jobs or those who went back to their hometown when we were closed, started uh, you know, take a, taking jobs in their hometown as well. So they, some of them didn't want to come back, but some of them were always in touch asking that, sir, when can I come back? And almost 40% of my staff is back, which I'm operating right now. And some of them have been fortunate to go abroad and I'm happy for them. Some of them have gone to other states or taken up alternate. And some of my staff, have taken up the cruise liner job because cruise also has started very late, but uh, the job opportunity is there, especially the international cruises. Some of them went into that. I'm also surprised because some of my uh, staff who don't look like they know more than their own department job are now into production. Uh, some of them have got into home cooked meals. Some have got into you know vacuum pressed, ready to cook food. They're doing that business and they're doing extremely well. I'm happy for them. So I, I never expected this from them. But you can say majority of the hoteliers will agree that at least 30% of the talented staff is gone. We can't get them back. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Um, hello, sir. Good evening, sir. I'm Kamakshi here. Yes. From Chennai. I mm -hmm. have a question like, uh, sir, if you are running a hotel, and how do you calculate your food production, sir, for that, like in the pandemic, how did you calculate your food, how much you have to, how many plates you have to make? How did you calculate upon those, sir? It, it was the most easiest thing to do. Okay. Uh, in the pandemic, what has happened is the trend has changed. 
earlier what used to happen is uh, if you're aware of cp plan that's the continental breakfast plan yeah the guest booked a room he would book a room with a breakfast okay now the trend is changed they say that give me cheaper rate but i don't want the breakfast okay so in the pandemic what happened is for example i had 40 staff staying indoors okay so i know that 40 staff i need uh -huh. to have x amount of rice x amount uh -huh. of dal x amount of vegetables to be provided on a daily basis okay now like you, do, you won't be having the uh, floating crowd who come and eat uh, your food is it no see in the pandemic it was totally shut so there was no restaurant business at all Okay, when it was slowly opening up, yeah. how did you calculate the floating uh, population? What, hap and what happened is, uh, it would always be by reservation. Reservation, okay. okay. So, guest would call and ask, is your restaurant open? Are you following the norms? Uh, norms. Are you following the sanitation? I want to huh. book a table. Huh. Yes. So, we would reconfirm with him in the evening so that we don't end up buying too much. We were keeping limited okay. portions. Okay. I, as I said, I mentioned that we used to have a QR code menu. Okay. So QR code menu wouldn't have some 40 pages or 30 pages. It would have just two, three pages of Please. what is movable. Okay. What is the maximum? See, see, thanks to the software, we come to know what are the popular items. Popular items. What needs okay. to be maintained. Okay. So it would, and uh, from the beginning, we had a habit of maintaining fresh stock. We never buy and keep in cold storage. Okay. We buy for the day. Suppose there is an event tomorrow, my uh -huh. uh, vegetables and my raw materials will come in today. Okay. What will always be in stock is like the rice, dal, which, don't, which have a larger shelf ah. life. Okay. But other things are procured one or two days before, depending on the demand, depending on pre-bookings. Pre okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Thank but you. Your session was really interesting and amazing to hear it, sir. Thank you. Thank you Hope so we much. all get back to normal and we have a good uh, year ahead. Yeah, because in my entire 30 plus years of my career, where I've spent two years in front of us, 26 years in sales and last three years in operations. I have come across three, four recessions, but I've never come across a situation where the hotel occupancy was zero, not a single guest in the lobby, not a single guest. And it was scary. Yeah, you, it will look very deserted actually for you right. to uh, see with the crowd and suddenly like nobody is there can at you, your place. Can you even guess the joy when we were, you know, waiting at reception, waiting for one guest to come and when once somebody arrives, we used to make him feel so special because we are also happy that someone came. You know that was the situation. So very sad situation, but now God, yeah. you know, I'm sure God will not let us yeah. suffer for long. Things will improve. Sure, sure. Thank you, sir. It was great listening to you and your experience. Sir. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for a stirring address. COVID-19 has affected every sector across the globe, and the hotel industry is among the hardest hit. Company management was zeroing down on the possible scenarios that may crop up during this badly hit period. So it took us through the journey of the two years of pandemic. He shared the glory and the merry time the hotels had witnessed before the pandemic with a special reference to the O Hotel and moved further discussing various dynamic situations, management stipulations, business limitations and government safety oriented regulations that came up which led to the restrictions on travel, outing, commute resulting in the decline of sales. This whole period led to the loss of good staff and good resources. It was more of a survival mode for the entire hospitality industry. Collaborate, cooperate, engage, revitalize, innovate, and adaptation of the digitalization were some of the dynamic strategies adopted by the company and the industry as a whole. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. I take immense pleasure in introducing our next guest, keynote speaker, Mr. Bijoy Thomas Palikal. Mr. Bijoy, an MBA graduate in marketing, advertising, and finance, from Cyber School of Management and Research, is the Chief Operating Officer of Abu Dhabi Corporation and SPAR UAE. Abu Dhabi Cooperative Society is a premier retail organization in the region with an annual sales of 485 million US dollars and 59 stores under the corporation, SPAR and Megamart brands. A qualified sales and profit-driven food retail 
marketing and innovation professional and with over 22 years leadership and functional head experience in multi format food retail supermarket operations in the gcc and in international markets so has a proven track record in the domain of strategic planning facilitation of new market entry successful commercial supplier relationship management e-commerce trade and customer ma marketing strategies advertising campaign development data driven marketing initiatives retail design and planning store and property development real estate and leasing franchise operations and strategic sales planning for profitable business growth so has also networked spar stores across regional markets namely oman qatar lebanon and currently developing the markets of ksa egypt and kuwait we are pleased to have you sir i now request professor shivaji mani assistant professor dypims to facilitate mr bijoy thomas palikil I request Mr. Bijoy to share his valuable thoughts. Thank you so much, ma'am. I hope I'm audible. Uh, yes, sir, you are. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it's a privilege. Dwaip Patel is in uh, Dwaip Patel Institutions are in Kolhapur, and uh, Kolhapur is very dear and close to my heart. Uh, I left Kolhapur about a decade and two two decades and a half ago, but my heart remains uh, in Kolhapur. yeah and uh, i love uh, some of my best buddies are from kolhapur i love the food in kolhapur uh, i love the people there everything about kolhapur is beautiful so it's a privilege to fill in a blank space that came up last evening and uh, get this uh, privilege to to address you all uh, via this uh, webinar uh that introduction was quite elaborate so there's not much to say except for the fact that uh, i started my career in advertising and uh, moved on to retail and uh, i have been privileged to represent uh, global retail organization spar uh, and the abu dhabi coop in the region and uh, been privileged to share experiences in various markets across the globe uh, about probably 36 odd countries of which uh, spar is present in 48 countries and i've i've been learning the businesses of about 36 countries uh, and that's a privilege and that's a lot of learning uh yes uh, it was lovely to hear mr manan uh all most of the industries uh, went through a very difficult patch uh, with the covid uh, situation and this seems to be manifesting over and over again it gives us a little bit of breathing space and then suddenly kicks in with a new variant and uh this uh i i like to say that uh, the wind is blowing on this gray cloud and this gray cloud is going to pass over our heads and we're going to have our days again uh but i come from an industry that's very resilient i come from the food retail business and the food retail business uh, unlike some of the other industries uh that actually had some of the major brands to their knees like if you look at the airline industry uh all all the major brands uh, hit their knees Uh, the hotel chains uh hospitality tourism uh everything that's got to do with travel uh luxury goods uh today in fact the impact of it is still on because uh availability is still not there uh ancillary units are not functioning so uh let's say you're not able to get the required support uh, original equipment manufacturers to deliver so that uh you know major manufacturers can actually comply to volume requirements so prices have gone up uh it's still a lot unstable uh but i wouldn't say it's insecure anymore as it was uh in in 2020 uh in 2020 it was new it came in uh, like a new kid of the block uh none knew how to face this no one knew what exactly uh we need to look, look forward to i can say on a personal experience uh, uh this came in about february 2020 and uh, i was supposed to i was due to celebrate my 50th on uh, on the 10th of may and when i told my dad now this covid thing has come in and i don't think i can come down and 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 do something about it and he said no no it's a matter of two months you'll be all right it's been two years and it's still manifesting so uh but i but i but i would like to say the world has come into terms with it have learned that this is a norm that we have to adapt 
uh, we have we are survivors we uh, we are innovative we need to be agile uh, and we need to find ways in which we have a business continuity plan and uh, continue with our businesses and move on with our lives and ensure that the the the, the wheels are still rolling yeah so that's uh, that's a bit of an intro before i upload my presentation so can i share a screen ma'am moderator yes sir Are we good? Is my screen visible? Not yet, sir. Really? Just give me a second, I could see it. How about now? Sir, it is still not visible. Should we uh, share it on I end? Uh, it's uh, it's the last presentation that I sent. Just give me a second. There shouldn't be a reason why uh, you shouldn't. Just give me a second. Let me. Just okay, sir. Again. How about now? Are we on? No, sir. Mm. Okay. Is there another screen being shared at the moment? No, sir. Sir, we have the PPT with us. Should we share go ahead, it? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, sir. You can't still see it, is it? No, sir. But we are trying to share it on our end. Okay. Can I can I just log out and come in in about five minutes max? I'll, I'll switch my laptop. Or would you take? Would it be easier for you to upload? Oh, you have uploaded. Okay, great. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yes, Bijoy, your PPT is just checked. Yeah, it is. Just it is on, but I, I see there's a lot of echo in 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 what's in the speech. Is that all right? So you are audible, sir. Okay, thank you so much. Sorry about that. Uh, and if that's the worst, please to happen, start. I think right. uh, there will not be any uh, echo. Yeah, I've started. I've started. I'm all right. I'm all right. Okay. So sorry about that. Uh, I hope I'm audible now. And uh, if that's the worst to happen in this presentation, it's okay, we can live with it. Uh, like I said, I represent SPAR. Uh, slide, next slide. Can you please flip the slide? Yeah. So our mission as, as SPAR is a global food retailer uh, with presence in over 49 countries. Uh, with a with a revenue of 39 billion 
uh, euros and with about 12,400 odd stores. So we are the largest food retail chain in the world when it comes to store numbers and independent store operations. Our mission is to remain the largest supermarket chain in the world and to continue building the brand and, and, and remain a global brand by growing uh, the future together with our customers, with our partners uh, and others that are inter instrumental in our business. Yeah, slide. Yeah, so like I said, we are in 49 countries, uh, a business of 49 billion euros and 12,545 stores. And I represent the part of the Middle East uh, and, and slide. Oh, this is not working. Yeah, so we are the sponsors of the International Athletic Championship. SPAR uh, is, is a global brand, like I said, and uh, we are very, very active with our brand building activities and sponsorships, uh, exposure awareness, and, uh, and, and the global athletic meet is one of the biggest uh, events, international events that we sponsor. Slide. Yeah, a few pictures to just show you how our stores look like. And I'll soon get into the topic of, of, of uh, today's discussion. So uh, our focus, please just keep shifting the slides till I say stop, yeah? So this are the, the, we are into, into, into global and local sourcing. We facilitate growers uh, in, in, in that particular region we operate. These are some of our stores in China. One you see down there is in Karnataka, Banargata Road, Bangalore. Uh, our, our stores are best of international practices. You will see a lot of emphasis in fresh, and uh, we we primarily believe in keeping the customer in the center of our business, and also to have very pretty retail units uh, in wherever we operate and reflect uh, a brand that's strong. Yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Can you go back one slide? So the core pillars of our business. Uh, is about remaining, giving full importance to being fresh in what we do, giving value to our shoppers, service, and uh, uh, an assortment and a choice that, that reflects their lifestyle and reflects their demography. When I say this, when you have a store uh, in India, you will see that the assortment in Pune will be very different from the assortment in, let's say, Kolapur for that matter. Not as much, but different. But when you come down south to, let's say, Chennai, it will be completely different because Palettes are different, our food habits are different. And I operate stores in a market with people from 220 countries. And uh, we sometimes have over 70,000 products on our shelves. And out of the 70,000 in a particular household, you won't see more than 350 to 400 uh, of these SKUs, shelf, shelf keeping units uh, present in the pantry. So let's say uh, 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 a Frenchman will have 350 SKUs that will be different from an Arab household, will be different from uh, an Egyptian household, will be different from an Indian household. So uh, the challenge in knowing what your shoppers really look for uh, to, to decide on the best assortment, ensure that that choice suits his requirement. And at the end of the day, gives him value. And of course, around fresh is the most important aspect of our business. Fresh is what brings in the customer. When I say fresh, it's about fruit and veg. It's about uh, the non-veg categories of delicatessens, uh, butchery, bakery, and so on and so forth. So fresh is what brings in the customer. Food is the honey. And when we say non-food, we make money. So that's that's how our business goes. That's a quick roundup of, of what SPAR is. And what I do in the business is I currently am the chief operating officer uh, for, for SPAR stores in the region. And uh, I have handled different roles in my past, starting from operations of stores to marketing, to advertising, to commercial, uh, new initiatives, uh, store development, mall development, and so on. Yeah. So now let's get on to the topic. Can I have the next slide, ma'am? I'm sorry I have to do this. Um, just didn't know why it didn't upload before. So students, ladies, gentlemen, uh, Fact, distinguished faculty members uh, of the Diva Patel Institution. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor. And I would be presenting to you how the pandemic uh, has reflected on our business, what has really happened in our business, how did we combat it, manage, and move on with our lives. The beauty of our business is food is the man's first basic need. Everybody needs food. Whether it's a pandemic or not, he needs to get his food. 
he needs to have his personal care. He needs to have a self hygiene. And, and one cannot do without this. And hence, we are also the most popular influencer when it comes to food and when, when it comes to the love for food. It's, it's, it's a pleasure that you can have. You cannot have any other pleasure in life as many times in a day as you can have with food. So it is, it is, a, it is man's basic need. It's something man, man enjoys a lot. And this will remain irrespective of what happens in the market. So this also makes food retail notoriously resilient to high critical external factors. And the pandemic was one of them. And the food business was strong, resilient against the pandemic situation. And the main reason for this, ma'am, can we move forward? Next slide. And the main reason for this is because uh, there was immense insecurity amongst customers, uh, amongst residents. And actually, it was not a choice of food or it was not the assortment that really mattered. It was food security that mattered and will availability be there. And when the pandemic just took off, nobody really knew how and when and what kind of manifestations are going to be there with this pandemic. So be it the state, be it the retailers, be it the customers, uh, there were several, several protocols that came out. And uh, there were some countries that didn't adopt anything. Yeah, they said it'll come and go. There were some people, while our neighbors interestingly said, it's better to see uh, uh, you know, people suffer from the pandemic rather than to see them die of hunger. So they knew it would hurt economies. Our, our immediate neighbors are, are, are immensely hurt after the pandemic to the extent of bankruptcy. So it was, it was very important that one gets really practical on a continuity plan when it comes to facing such an uncertain situation, which nobody has. I've been in the business for 22 years. Uh, I haven't seen anything like this. Like my, Mr. Mayor, we have seen several recessions we know how to manage, but not in a, in a global pandemic uh, of such a magnitude, of such a scale. So this changed food retailers into what we call frontline services. So frontline services are usually doctors, uh, paramedical staff, uh, and such support systems. But suddenly food retailers turned out to be frontline service. It was the most important service uh, after uh, medical care that was there uh, needed during the pandemic. And we had to keep our stores operational. So essentially we had to guarantee food security for the residents. It was important that people get their food. They, they shouldn't, and, and if, if that insecurity crept in, the worst that could happen in a pandemic is hoarding, food hoarding. And once food hoarding comes in, uh, uh, it's the survival of the fittest. Whoever can, uh, can manage to mass it will have it, and then suddenly there'll be shortages and there'll be wastage. So we turned out to be frontline service providers, and we had to manage uh, keeping our stores operational, keeping our shelves filled, ensuring that the shopper comes in, he doesn't feel insecure at all. We removed shelves and started to keep big, huge pallets on our, shell, on our, on our selling area so that we conveyed scale and we con conveyed magnitude so that the shoppers do not feel insecure about of not getting their basic essentials or not getting baby food for their children uh, or, and so on and so forth. So it was very important that we conveyed to the shopper that he would definitely uh, continue to get his supplies. Though we were very uncertain of supply chain, we were very uncertain of logistics, we were very uncertain of warehousing. It was a challenge until we got into it and we faced it and we will see that down the line. Let's go, slide. So the principal learnings that we had is that the customer connect and communications was the most important. It was very, very important to keep talking to the customers because their emotions were the most, the essential, we essentially, as food readers, we essentially have a stake in the emotions of the population. And, and this emotion had to be managed through proper communication. And this more than uh, the external stakeholders, the internal stakeholders, our team, our people need to be needed to feel secure, uh, needed to feel that they are safe. And uh, because nobody really, I mean, if you remember when it started in 2020, when you hear of uh, a Corona patient or, or a COVID-19 positive, you immediately talk about quarantining the area, secluding it. It was, it was chaotic, it was chaotic. And there was so much of uh, 
uh, I would use the word misunderstanding around this whole phenomenon uh, and, and people reacted not knowing what exactly to face. Uh, I'm a veteran, I've, I've been hit with COVID three times. So, uh, and I know it just comes and goes and I enjoyed the best movies on Netflix and uh, I had a good sitting, but due respects and with all emotions, yes, there are people who have suffered with this. I, I fully understand that. And it needed to be seen with its seriousness, but not chaos. Businesses like ours needed to be agile and agility turned out to be the new word uh, in our mission statement. We needed to adapt so quickly to, to, the, to the new announcements and protocols and regulations that would come up from the state uh, and from the governing bodies. And we had to comply with it. And as uh, uh, Mr. Menon said before, uh, heavy fines are imposed when you can't comply with them. For example, if I have 250 staff in a hypermarket, and let us say we are talking about the FMCG category, which is the, the food, the packaged food category. And if one supervisor falls COVID, positive, immediately 30 people go into quarantine. And where do you bring uh, people to fill up this gap? So there had to be a whole business continuity plan. And, and this plan needed to be heftily agile to ensure that we could adapt to any, uh, any, any call that would come. Supply chain and backend integration until source. We, we had to literally have cargo flights from various cargo providers who would ship uh, basic food from various parts of the world. Our, our processing centers and our packaging centers were overloaded 24 hours, three shifts a day. Uh, they were working uh, to ensure that the supplies are there. Because that, it's not that suddenly you have, let's say, a few million people in your market, and that's your, that's your transactions in a day. It's not that this is going to multiply by 20. No, it's just that if 100 people came to your store every single day, instead of buying 50, they started to buy 100. And, and we started seeing 70%, 80% increase in purchase. We knew this is hoarding. We definitely knew it is hoarding, but the back end needed to support so that the shelves are full and this hoarding uh, messaging doesn't suddenly spread around and people start being insecure of, of not being able to have. So when you have this kind of uh, a growth or, or, or this kind of a sales increase on the selling floor, your logistics, your warehousing, your processing, everything needed to be uh, strong. Everything needed to be suddenly working on 200% capacity uh, to ensure that you're, you're, you're able to, to hold up with the demand of the shoppers. We needed to be strong with our marketing because uh, wait, we are socially responsible uh, as food retailers and as the number one retailer here, we had to be uh, socially accountable that there would not be practices by other retailers and smaller retailers by increasing pricing uh, and, and things like that. So we had to ensure that our communications were very strong. Uh, shopper loyalty had to be returned when we participate and when we share their emotions, they start being more loyal with your business. And to be honest, promotions, there was no elasticity whatsoever. Price was in the factor. Uh, it didn't matter if you were selling the cheapest. It didn't matter if you had promotions for the weekend. Uh, it was just availability that had to make uh, that had to be made sure. So the market was not uh, elastic at all for promotions, and availability was the key. These were our principal learnings, and and this is what what would have that was seen across the industry with all retailers when we sit across tables and discuss this exactly what everybody has seen is the same pattern. Slide. So food retailers, we were, we were really responding to an unprecedented demand that strained the entire ecosystem, our entire ecosystem from source, from countries of origin. Uh, some of our countries where we operate are not producing countries, everything is imported. Uh, so the entire ecosystem of, of, of availability at source, uh, there's a whole, uh, warehousing at source, uh, shipping, logistics from source to market, clear and availability of vessels to, to import. All this was challenged heftily. Freight kind of went up 500%. If it costed 100, it then now costed, it then costed 500. So freight was also a challenge. So freight, uh, be it uh, the, the, the whole organization at, at the country of origin, uh, shipping to reaching where we are and then into our stores, was the complete ecosystem was challenged. Customers from all demography had shifted buying behavior. Uh, you know, people wanted contactless shopping, digitally enabled fulfillment, 
uh, ushering a new norm in food retail that may become permanent. I mean, if you see what has happened, I have slides down. If you see what has happened in the in the in the in the e-commerce space during this time, is is tremendous because people had the fear of uh, uh, you know any sort of body contact, any sort of uh, getting close uh, or, or 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 social distancing uh, criteria that came up. So contactless shopping also suddenly started to creep in. So food retailers were challenged at all fronts. This brought us into an environment that essentially needed innovation. We needed to realign our supply chains. We need to redefine our workforce uh, and renew the need, gain deeper customer insights to connect with loyal shoppers. So the challenge that we had, one was availability, one was ensuring that shoppers are secure, two was making sure our ecosystem could live up to the sudden surge of demand. And, and we knew this was a matter of uh, you know, a, a short period. Uh, that was our gut feel but nobody really could predict how long. Just, just before I had, uh, there was a question that came uh, to, to the previous speaker saying, how long, I wish we could say this. Uh, we don't know what sort of manifestations. I mean, out of nowhere came Omnicom. We thought we were at the end of it. We thought business were coming back to normal. People will start traveling, people will start investing, uh, people will start spending and, and, and consumerism will start picking up again. But suddenly there came Omnicom and, and there came flights have started to be regulated. But there are uh, countries like the UK who says, let's keep this open. Let this just come and go. Uh, let's not hurt our businesses. Let's not hurt our economy. So there are different schools of thought. I, I don't think this is the right forum to even advocate on any or debate for or against any. But end of the day, uh, it's uncertain. We don't know. We really don't know how long this is going to be there and how many manifestations are yet to be seen. Uh, but we know one thing, our business has to go on. People need to have food. Uh, availability has to be ensured. Uh, producing countries have to produce. Manufacturing countries need to manufacture. Uh, we need to come back together. This ball has to get rolling. And uh, else uh, we, are, we are still going to see the wrath of it that will come further down the line. Can we shift slide? So a sustainable and flexible business continuity plan was the most important. We started it as early as in 2020 when the first announcement in Wuhan came in, uh, we knew it was coming uh, and we had to prepare our business uh, to be ready for this. Like I said before, we were agile to adapt and play ball with the authorities in the best interest of our customers. Every day there was a new regulation. Every day there would be a new announcement. Uh, borders would get closed, borders would get open. There would be regulations on who comes in and who doesn't come in. Uh, we had to adapt ourselves and play ball and ensure that you know the, the game continues. Enable better reallocation of resources. So let's say what we did was, when you say the business continuity plan, if our stores were operating three shifts, we downsized each shift and created a buffer shift in every single store. So when there was a case of, of, uh, of uh, a COVID positive, or there were tests that needed to be conducted every week in our stores. And if we have two or three cases, which means if you have three cases, another 40 or 50 goes into quarantine. So you needed to have a buffer team that's always there. So our business continuity plan had a fourth and a fifth shift. And we had people from, so a butcher cannot work in the bakery and a baker cannot be in the fruit and veg. So we had, each of them had their own skill sets. Each of them had their own specialisms. So we needed to have uh, these, staff grouped in a particular way that if even if a whole shift in a particular store is is uh, quarantined then you immediately have this buffer team that comes in but there again there's a challenge all of them live we provide accommodation if one of the staff in the accommodation uh, gets uh, gets a covid positive who, whoever he lives within that dome so that we have about 30 of them whoever he lives within that dome all of them going to uh, all of them going to quarantine. So it was such a challenge, and we need to needed to manage our resources in a way that every single shift, the stores are open, the stores are stocked, stacked, the, the products are available, the cashiers are present, and make sure that there are no queues and rushes in the stores because the, uh, the, we had lockdown. There were few hours where the trade had to be there, and we had to manage our shoppers without hurting their emotions. So the best option was how could we reach the products to the shopper. And this is not something that you can adapt into immediately. Home deliveries are easy to be said, 
but it's not something that you can adapt. Yes, we we were in the e-commerce much before. We were working with aggregators, but it, when when that scale suddenly about one and a half two percent was our overall e-commerce uh, share of business. This suddenly jumped to six percent, which means we grew our delivery services three times. So you don't have the capacity for the last mile and everything that's uh, you know in terms of bagging everything. We, you don't have that capacity to to accommodate such though that would have been the best option, but that's not easily doable. So we had to manage our resources and ensure uh, that there is no panic buying in the market. Enable quick digital transformations. Uh, this is again what I was talking about. Uh, you know, digital transformations at the store level, contactless shopping, uh, cashless movement, e-pays, and the others. Uh, uh, Self checkouts uh, where you don't have cashiers, and the cashiers need to be secured. So all this needed to be. See, today we know exactly. We've been through this for a year, so we know what all needs to be done to adapt ourselves. But uh, those days, it was it was a bit chaotic and dedicated services for senior citizens maternity moms uh, frontline service personnel this is the way we could we could identify with the society uh, and and the demography of the shoppers that we cater to understand the needs there and cater to them so we would try and identify where which are the households where we have uh, senior citizens and close to our branches we would plot them uh, on 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 by building we have vertical living here they're all apartments very few villa formats and uh, we had to identify these homes and make sure that they call with they're they are catered to. Yeah, next slide. So what were the changes in the shopper behavior? What did we see during this time? Apparel, beauty, makeup were least important. Health and wellness became a major focus. I mean, who in the who in their wildest dreams would have thought we would need gondolas after gondolas of sanitizers? Who would have thought uh, the shop front would be stacked with face masks? We would have never thought of something like that. Uh, suddenly, products of, of uh, hygiene and, and home care started to pick up. That all had sales like they had never ever seen before. Uh, everything uh, close to that Clorox and the others, disinfectors. We started to see a change in, in the complete focus. And, and some of that still remains. Some of that still remains uh, because um, even though this has kind of been uh, adopted as, as a norm, you still have to adopt some of those behavior changes also that, uh, that, that uh, came into play with, with the pandemic. Uh, people don't feel safe any longer to shop at wet markets. Everybody loves to go to the local fish market or the local fruit and veg market uh, or the local uh, meat market. But uh, once the pandemic came up, one didn't feel safe going to such wet markets and they would depend on organized retail or hypermarkets to buy their products. The mindsets uh, changes due to moods and sentiments. Uh, I don't know if you have heard this, but uh, yes, like well, it was said by, my, by, by Mr. Man, and a lot of people lost their jobs, which means their livelihoods. People started downsizing their shopping. That's my next point. Uh, somebody who believed in, in, in a particular brand was willing to compromise and buy the second or the third brand uh, because everybody had an insecurity of their jobs. And uh, yes, a lot of businesses closed down. A lot of people lost their uh, jobs. Many families uh, kept the breadwinner here because it's an expat population area where we live, where, where the markets where I operate in. And when the school started to do be online, everybody went to the, the send their families back to their homes and uh, uh, so relatively the consumption reduced and uh, and this also started to downtrade the overall shopping otc medication and supplements uh, sales were amazing we, we we just had one single corner shelf in the past now uh, they are at the forefront of our stores and we had to be bold with the right categories there was there was no point because every time there's a sales drop the particular salesman or the supplier or the brand representation will want to push his product irrespective of the fact uh, that it was an important category during this period. But at that stage also, it was important for retailers like ourselves to know if we were really uh, bringing in the right categories and we are really focusing on what really mattered to the customer and to the shopper. Slide. So we've been able to withstand the impact 
but needed to evolve new strategies to thrive in a post COVID-19 era. So let's think of something positive, yeah. So yes, all that happened during the, the COVID era. Uh, it wasn't uh, rosy, but it taught us a lot. It made us more resilient. It made us more creative, it made us more innovative. And we knew if we can face a situation like that, uh, going forward, it, it was a prep for, for any contingency that can arise uh, in times to come. And what we needed to more needed most in these phases is to sustain to sustain the workforce and ensure they are agile and impactful decisions sustain the organization to create value for all stakeholders see it, it's 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 key it's key that uh, yes the shopper is a stakeholder but the employee is another stakeholder the shareholder is another stakeholder everybody needed to continue uh, uh, continue to experience their beneficial aspects of the business and, and this had to continue and sustain society as it experiences multiple existential threats uh, and sustain operations to the most pressing workforce priorities. So your stores were challenged and the workforce needed to be, be motivated enough to, to, to face these operational challenges. Uh, you had the society who were challenged for their jobs, challenged with the sickness, challenged with insecurity. Many people couldn't visit their loved ones back home. There's a lot of emotional, uh, uh, emotional trauma that 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 was created amidst shoppers, and and this needed to be addressed because we have a role. The, you know, today when you look at the customer or the consumer index, what really is is a, a key or or a measure is the spending in, in in groceries and food, and uh, that shows whether he's happy or not. And when you see average transaction dropping by 20, 25 percent, you know what's really happening. The insecurity levels have picked up. Uh, sustain the organization. The, uh, nothing happens if the company doesn't remain. And if that has to be so, the workforce has to remain. So this was the most important learning that we had. All the key stakeholders around our businesses need to be secured and they needed to feel confident about what's being done with their businesses. It's, it's, they all are stakeholders, owners of these businesses, right from the shopper to the, uh, the, the staff on the floor. Everybody needed to be secure. Everybody needed to know that the, the, the whole effort is to sustain what we are doing. Slide. So what should we, going forward, what should we actually think of? Should all products and categories perform as they used to? For example, you had face care and face care, you brands like Olay, Pons, uh, L'Oreal, uh, Neutrogena, these are all uh, uh, mass retail brands. Uh, their sales had dropped over 60 65% and they continued to remain that way. So should priority be given, given to face care? Would shoppers continue to demand personal care, beauty? Would, would consumers continue? I mean, <laughs> we've been seeing face masks for a long time. Ask any lipstick manufacturer. I'm sure there's a huge decline in sales of lipstick because, and, and, and young girls and ladies who, who, who probably in this forum today understand what I'm talking about. Uh, will customers continue to be brand loyal? Will they continue to prefer the premium brands that they buy or will they down trade? Should private labels, if, if you know, I understand I'm addressing students here, private labels are, uh, you know, you will see a, a, a milk drink, let's say Bonita, and that's a chocolate milk drink. And then a retailer X will bring out his own product, which is an X chocolate milk drink. So that's a private label. It's, it's manufactured by the retailer. He, he, he tends to make a better margin and he'll be able to sell it at either entry level in the strata, entry strata of, of the category, or it depends on what his private label strategy is. It essentially need not be the cheapest. That's a whole subject by itself. Private label and private label development is a whole subject. So let me not dwell on it. But having said that, should we manufacture more private labels because shopper priorities are changing, they want value. So if you say markets like Europe, uh, let's take Tesco, let's take Sainsbury, let's take Spar, 55, 60% of their sales come from private label and not a brand. A brands are the likes that are manufactured by the Unilever's, PNGs of the world. And uh, these retailer brands compete head on with these A brands and they sometimes have share of revenue of about 57, 58%. Tesco is one of the best. Tesco is, is uh, out of the UK and uh, Tesco sales about 57%, they're the third largest retailer in the world. 
and about 57% of their revenue comes from private label, and that's how important private label is in the business. So retailers like ourselves should be uh, actually start investing more into developing private labels in essential categories where one brand royalty may not be there or can be challenged. Should we collaborate more with man private label manufacturers or negotiate better terms with principles? So if you continue to build your own brands, so you will start challenging the likes of, for example, let's say Ariel is a PNG brand, it's detergent. And let's say the X spa retailer, spa comes in with a spa brand, uh, top loading washing machine liquid. And, and likewise, Ariel is there. And if shoppers start to take more of this because they see value and they see the quality is there, maybe we can go back to the principles that is these A brand manufacturers and challenge them and tell them, uh, you know, either you give us better share of your margin or we will start, you know, taking over your space in our sales with our private label. So it was, it was a decision whether we should take end of the day, shoppers have become more value centric than they have ever been. When I say value, it doesn't mean cheap. Yeah, it doesn't have to be the cheapest. It's value. If you're giving good quality products and, and these products are being sold at a price that makes sense to the shopper. And at the moment of truth, moment of, all the efforts, all the advertising, everything, all from product development, all your four piece, five piece, whatever you call it, uh, comes into realization at the moment of truth, which is the shop, the, the selling floor. And at that point, your brand needs to be on top of the mind. Recall a shopper is there in front of the detergent aisle, he sees a spar liquid detergent and he sees an aerial liquid detergent and he sees he's going to spend only 30%. Uh, he's going to, it's going to be 30% less expensive for an equally good product of a retailer brand and he decides to pick that up. Yes, that's the moment of truth and that's where you're working towards. So after the pandemic, with all the challenges that came into the wallet, shoppers started to be more conscious about what they take home, be more conscious about the bill that comes at the, at the, at the till at the end of the day. So it was very, very uh, important for retailers like ourselves in our business plan going forward to know the level of importance that private label needs to have in our business. Should we be investing in revamping our large stores and partial fulfillment centers? See, I, I, can, I can put it this way. Uh, some of our stores are about 120,000 square feet. And my smallest store is 1,800 square feet. Yeah. Now the big stores are the hypermarkets, as we call it. It's very fancy. Yeah. But end of the day, if the pandemic is going to reach a stage where shoppers are shifting more to e-grocery, and if shoppers are not really happy about coming into the store, and and they would find the neighborhood convenience stores more important uh, because it's convenient. You go by, you fulfill, and you reach your your, your risk of being exposed is much lesser. So then what's the point of these huge stores, which will sooner or later be white elephants, because they will not be productive. You have 12,000 square meters, 120,000 square feet stores, which was before the pandemic, the most preferred shopping destination, it gave me almost 65% uh, of my revenue and almost, uh, almost uh, again, 70, 75% of my profit came from these big stores. Now suddenly shoppers started to go less into these big hypermarkets and started to depend on the neighborhood stores, started to depend on online uh, shopping. And, and if these stores are still going to remain as big, you need to merchandise them, you need to keep them serviced, you need to have the stuff. So we need to start reviewing our business formats. Should we continue with this format? Should we convert some of these store into partial fulfillment uh, centers for e-grocery? So e-grocery fulfillment centers are, are much smaller and you start fulfilling the online orders from these stores. So businesses like ours needed to rethink the format and the propositions that we had for our shoppers. Should we get closer to a customer by directing investments in compact convenience stores? So, so let's say you have the compact convenience stores, you have the supermarkets, you have the compact hypermarkets or the neighborhood uh, supermarkets, and then you have the hypermarkets. So we, we in our business is a multi-format business. We have these four formats. And after the pandemic, there were serious thoughts given, which is the format uh, that we should grow our business with. And honestly, we yet don't have an answer. We yet don't have an answer because this seems to be, the, the shopper behavior seems to be changing uh, continuously. The, the, the protocol seems to be changing continuously. And, and today we have reached a stage, one side of the book is to say, 
okay, we've had enough of this. We're going out and living our lives normal. There's another side that says, no, let's be careful. Let's hold back. We don't take our kids out. We stay in the house. And there's another side, which is somewhere in between. They follow a hybrid. So when you have four formats that you offer to the shoppers, you really don't know what's going to be the trend going forward. So we have a strategy. It's not something I can be loud about, but uh, we have a strategy to be uh, to, to draw a line, to have a hybrid. I'm trying to find the right word so that I don't spill the bean out or let the cat out of the sack. But uh, what we're trying to do right now is reinvent our business, come about with a format that clubs all the omni-channeled uh, requirements to be put together and, and that way present to our shoppers. So that's, that's where we're moving. So there's a whole paradigm shift that's happening uh, in, in the way we think about our business right from product to promotions. So the place that we sell, the price at which, is, which we sell and we are able to sell and bring about value to the shoppers and the place at which we sell. So there's a whole shift uh, of thought that's, that's happening at the moment. And, and let me tell you, all retailers are on their drawing boards. Everybody's on their drawing boards. We've just reached that stage where people are coming back to work for that matter. Everybody was still working from home. Uh, yes, it works well, but end of the day, uh, you know, when you start seeing each other, feeling each other, knocking each other on the head, it makes a lot more different uh, to, to business and then the way people see their business. Next slide. Like I said, uh, Omni channel is, is key and has been a mission ever before the pandemic. Every retailer was trying to get the e-grocery business right. And let me tell you, nobody got it right. I mean, uh, retailers like Walmart in the US, uh, the co-ops in the UK, Tesco in the UK, SPA in various markets, Austria, Norway, uh, UK. Uh, everybody seems to be learning every day. And this trade is continuously evolving and maturing. So e-grocery will change the way in which we do our business. Yes. See, for example, when you go to, a, to your local supermarket, you start seeing products in bulk and you can weigh, let's say, two kgs of apple or one kg of apple, how you would like it. But you will start seeing, soon seeing, you don't see these loose packs and you will see a pre-pack of two kg and a one kg and it's your choice to take a one kg or a two kg you cannot pick and pack your apples because and you wouldn't need to because every retailer will be forced to give quality and you cannot get a one and a half so you'll have to get a one or you can take a two this is how we are seeing trade in and then the stores become much smaller because uh, what has happened in the western world especially in in the markets that i operate in uh, a lot of what happens in europe is adopted and you will see that these pure play operators or aggregators, as we call it, for example, in our markets, I don't know if you have them in India, where you have the Insta shops and you have these aggregators who come together, uh, you know, and then they have their app and you have four or five uh, retailers that are on these app. I'm sure you have them because technology are far ahead, but I don't know if retailers operate this or aggregators operate this. Aggregators are the guys who bring together all these retailers under one platform, and you can literally choose from that. And, and your choices are limited to what you see as an image on the screen uh, and, and you can compare prices and you can shop. So it got, there's a lot of change that's happening and, and people knew, the, I mean, shoppers knew and retailers like ourselves knew that this is going to happen. We just didn't know. Uh, we just thought we had, we can go at a slower pace, but today uh, we are all at the forefront of, of digitizing our business and, and, and making where our, our, our strategies on how we operate with pure play uh, app operators, how do we operate with the aggregators and what should be our uh, role or what should our app or our shopping page or our e-commerce page look like? Should we also open a marketplace and offer the whole categories, right, right from pet grooming to uh, sophisticated hair salons, or should we just be confined to what we do uh, in our business and, and just offer the food and what we know to do? So there's a lot of thought that's going around. The first time I attended the World Retail Congress, this is about uh, a decade and a half ago, about 15 years. Uh, online was the blue-eyed baby. Everybody spoke big about it. And let me tell you, even today, except for some very, very few mature markets in the Far East, like Korea, uh or for that matter hong kong 
or uh, let's say London as a city by itself, not the suburbs, uh, they all have immense influence of e-commerce and, and e-grocery, immense. Because then if, if you look at uh, Korea, it's unbelievable how uh, these people see technology and how they adopt that into their businesses. But that's not the case in some of the markets like where I operate in the Middle East, where you know, in this, uh, the, the only entertainment that you have in the peak of summer is to go to grocery shopping with your family. So, you know, it's, it's a preferred trip. Everybody loves doing it. It's a family event. So, uh, and, and unlike in some of these markets, okay, this is something that, that could probably shock us in India. Uh, family sizes are very small. You're either singles or they have live-in relationships. And the, the institution of family is, is very, very less seen these days. This is a big challenge. Uh, for people like me in our business because they don't cook at home anymore. They all order in their food and take away food. Uh, you, you, you'll be surprised if I told you, or may not be surprised because you're probably well exposed. Uh, housing units in some of these markets do not have a kitchen anymore. They just have a reheating facility. Uh, I live in an apartment uh, where my kitchen is the smallest space, while five years back I lived in an apartment where the kitchen is the, is the biggest space. One of the biggest challenges that Western retailers are facing today is bringing families to sit on the dining table. Don't get shocked. This is for real. At least one time in a year to sit around the table and have a meal together. Okay, so this is where the institution of family is disintegrating. And, and this means, okay, I remember my past trips to the Western world, I would see FMCG taking, I mean, packaged food products taking about 60% of the supermarket shelf space. Today, that's 20%. And, and the 40% is taken by either pre-cooked or partially cooked or semi-cooked meals. So this is what people tend to, uh, people tend to shop uh, these days. So yes, uh, the F&B business, like uh, Mr. Menem was saying, is definitely uh, bound to grow. You will see more dark kitchens coming into play. You will start seeing restaurants uh, which are vegetarian, where they will have a small cross-section that sells Chinese uh, as a dark kitchen. So uh, this, this whole model of f &B will change and you will see a lot of that coming into the supermarket retail space. So you take the Whole Foods in the US or you take the Harris Teeter or you take Sainsbury or you take Whole Foods, uh, sorry, um, Waitrose in, in the UK uh, or spa stores uh, in, in, in Austria, in the UK, in Ireland, they all, almost 35, 40% of their stores look like a restaurant. It's like a food court. They served prepared meals. And, and that's where you get good quality value meals. And so the whole concept of family dining, the whole concept of cooking at home seems to be losing its ground. And even if you look at the institution of family, family sizes are disintegrating to less than 2%. So every, every family size is 1 1.4, 1 1.3. That's, that's the level at which uh, the whole concept of, of, of family is reducing. And this is a huge challenge in our business. And all of them will resort to online uh, shopping, but not uh, groceries. They will, they'll, they'll start ordering food online. So this is where the market is shifting. This is where the whole shopper behavior is changing. And like he as food retailer heads above this wave and, and start seeing few decades ahead of us when we plan our stores today, because each of our stores, the investment, our ROI is, is anywhere between six to seven years. Okay, this is average. Some stores sometimes do well, sometimes some stores don't do as well, but it takes about five, five years uh, to get our uh, return on investment back. So when we plan a store, we have to plan at least a decade ahead and, and shopper behavior, shopper trends, uh, and consumerism and consumer behavior is changing so rapidly that you need to really be wise in knowing where your eggs are going to be. And uh, uh, it's not the chicken and the egg story, it's the egg and the chicken story. So you gotta put your eggs in and then you ensure that you hatch out enough to sustain the shareholder. Slide. So this is the growth of e-commerce that you're seeing. So uh, during COVID times, they more than doubled uh, in, in the markets of United Arab Emirates and, and KSA. I haven't mentioned the other markets here because they're not as mature as these two markets uh, when it comes to online grocery. And if you see, I have uh, the, the three graphs that you see is quarter one, quarter two, and quarter three. 
So if you see the way from quarter one, from let's take, uh, I'm, I'm talking about UAE now, the one in the red, uh, you see a light peak of 478 million. From there, it went to 1,005 million to 1,120 million US dollars. All this happened in one year, quarter to quarter, three months gap. That's the rapid or, or that's the pace at which change happens. And, and people like us who invest so heavily into these stores, uh, when we cannot sit back and say, we don't see the sort data is the big thing. Analysts are, are, are so key. I'm surrounded by them and I'm, I'm, I look as good as they make me uh, look to be. Uh, and, and these analytics need to be put uh, into perspectives that help us take uh, good business decisions. So this is the pace at which we have seen growth in the e-commerce business uh, over during the pandemic times. Slide. So, like I said before, store model and realignment, we started to shift and, and, and post pandemic, our stores sizes, our store uh, formats and priorities on formats have changed. We started looking at hybrid formats that complement the e-commerce business. Like I said, every, all the large stores, some of them started to have fulfillment centers. And it's not just the size of the store. It also needed to have support infrastructure to bring in uh, the logistics, to bring in the delivery vehicles, to make sure there's a proper in and out uh, system that can be implemented in that particular store. Based on those, we started to make hybrid formats in our existing stores. We started to optimize store size. If, if, if a 12,000 square meter store is as productive as a 5,000, why would I need a 12,000 square meter? 5,000 should do to give me the same level of sales and profit. So we started to optimize our store size and optimize our assortment. Review hypers to accommodate fulfillment centers for e-grocery. Click and pick up hubs in proximity with ease access. This is basically, we, it's, it's an omni-channel environment in the e-commerce space where you have click and collect, click and deliver, uh, and, and click and pick up. So uh, this is where uh, we started to facilitate where somebody can place their orders and their bag will be ready at a particular hour and they could come and pick it up. Uh, compact and cashierless, no contact stores, that's, that's clear. And of course, dark stores as fulfillment centers. So many of our stores that were out of city and some of our stores in the city started to be converted into dark stores and fulfillment centers fully, fully. And that because we just saw in the previous slide, what is the pace at which uh, the online grocery shift was happening from brick and mortar, from regular uh, retail stores. Yeah, so that shift in shopper behavior had to be quickly adopted by us retailers and, and we had to be agile and, and change the way in which we start offering. Slide. This is what, what, what you're seeing here is, is, is what a click and collect is. So orders are bought there. Each one has their own uh, little box. They have numbers, they key in those, those numbers and the box opens and you collect your order and you leave. So if you're working uh, in a particular area, let's say Law College Road, or let's say in a particular uh, place in, in a city, you would have these, uh, these, these units uh, on high streets and each retailer will have their collect pickup centers. And this is, uh, one, this is a very interesting model that suddenly picked up. It started in, in the north of France, and now you see it all over the UK. And uh, Amazon is going strong with these uh, collection centers uh, across US now. So safety concerns were one reason why retailers adopted this contactless concept, a seismic shift towards the cashless economy is the other, uh, where everybody started to operate on cards, uh, cash, pay, currency, has, has dropped down to an all-time low. Digital wallets have picked up, uh, you know, the, the, the Google Pay, Apple Pay, and, and so on and so forth. So it's almost becoming a cash-free economy and, and contactless shopping. Uh, everything happens in the online space. So uh, again, I'm going back just to help you recall what I said before. So should we continue with these huge stores with all these displays, or should we just have fulfillment centers, warehousing facilities, and last mile delivery uh, solutions? And, and proper digitization app enabled IT infrastructure to support this business. Uh, this, is, this is the change uh, that's really, really brought about into our business post pandemic. We knew this before the pandemic. It's not that this, this was not, we, we saw this shift, we saw this change, but the, the pace at which it came during the pandemic and post pandemic, uh, all our focus are now towards these uh, new age Gen X shopper behavior. Next.
slide. Yeah. So again, rise of private labels and portfolio consolidation, like I said before, I'm not going to dwell on this so much because I've explained this. Rising uncertainty in economic growth have led consumers to be careful and look for value for money products. So private labels are considered value for money uh, uh, options or assortment that one would want to shop. This has led to an opportunity for retailers to revise their portfolio and align to con consumer choices for a simpler and cost-effective supply chain. So it's all about finding the right sources, finding the right products, ensuring they're made available either in your uh, online space or in your brick and mortar, and ensure that the shoppers feel confident that they're not buying something cheap and substandard. But see, when you have the retailer's name attached to the product, be assured he will be selling quality product because end of the day, what really matters is the brand. And if you sell cheap quality products in your brand name, it's going to hurt your entire business. Retailers like ourselves, we have a whole research and development uh, that goes into R&D, that goes into product development. We call it NPD, new product development. And, and this goes from food to frozen, to chilled, to packaged, canned, and as well, non-food. Uh, suddenly, superfood is, is, is so prominent on, on the shopper space in the non-food category, sports and, and well-being and, and health products are important. And, and these products don't have any, any particular brand that's really gaining ground. So you can de definitely develop private labels here. You know, on a personal level, uh, it probably makes sense saying this. My son is into culinary and he's into uh, gastronomy and nutrition. And, and what he's working towards is, uh, yes, he wants to be a chef. He wants to be in the F&B business. But more than that, he's looking at new product development. Can you just imagine that one person who found out the, 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 the concept or the recipe for a two-minute noodle and sold it to Nestle uh, and under the brand name Maggie? Do you know what kind of money that guy makes today? So that's, that's new product development. And this can be done in private labels. So Tesco and Spar, Spar in Austria has a huge laboratory for new product development. And, and this is into private label. And some of these products are even sold to A brands at a later date. So this is a huge, I mean, like I said, private labels is a whole subject by itself. It is something that determines uh, even, the, even the existence of a retailer in times to come. This is my personal belief. Uh, and it's so important that all retailers start investing and start understanding which are the categories to get involved in, what are the kind of assortment that we got to have, and, and how do we nail it right. It need not be the cheapest, but it can be entry level. Uh, see, for example, let's take the oil category. Yeah. So, and I'll take sunflower, okay? Or let's say what you're, yeah, I think you guys are also more exposed to sunflower oil. So, you will have a sunflower oil brand at entry level, which is the cheapest in the category. And then you will have another sunflower oil that competes with Stunfest. Uh, or you will have another sunflower oil with a proposition that says super refined or it says virgin or you know, in olive oil, virgin and, and cold press. And these are the categories that really come in the super premium. So you have one of your private labels in each of the strata, entry level, mid-tier and premium. Even if you take 10% share Profitability will be maximum from your private label than from selling these A brands. And this is how private labels work. So you're bringing quality products. You're giving your shopper a choice. You're giving them an option to take value. And at the end of the day, uh, your profitability is secured. So th this is definitely going to be, it is already in Europe and in the US, this is big. US maybe not because uh, I, I see a lot of uh, uh, A brands are still holding strong against private labels, but in Europe, private labels have moved far, far ahead. Uh, and, and where it really matters is when the retailers start to see private labels as giving the shopper an option for a better quality product at a better price, rather than seeing, I want to manufacture the cheapest and compete in the category and increase my bottom line. Never be bottom line driven, always be top line driven. Always focus everything that you do on the top line. And top line, as long as you secure top line, top line comes from number of customers, and each basket value, how much they shop at your store, right? You focus on these two, bottom line will come by itself. But if you focus on bottom line and increase your retail selling price, and even if your customers drop your profits keep going back, it's not long-term, you shoot your own foot that way. So long-term strategy, 
definitely private label is a key factor in any retailer's uh, business model. Can we move forward? So key questions that you ask the executive management team. End of the day, it's people like us who takes the call, right? So what's most important for us to hear the customer, hear our colleagues at all levels of the hierarchy, and listen to our shareholders, but don't let them push you. Don't let the board push you. How are we connecting with our customers? How do we earn their loyalty? This is the key question. Keep the cent, keep your customer at the center of your business. It's not, it's seriously guys, it's, it's, not, it's not a management book thingy. This is what really matters. Your customer needs to be delighted. He needs to continue shopping with you. He needs to be your advocate. There's nobody better advertising your store and your services and your differentiation. You know, I was, I was just listening to Manoj say about having live kitchen and wood fire ovens. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, I was asking my son, what kind of a restaurant do you want to open? And he said, I want to do Instagrammable food. And I was like, mate, I've heard Chinese, Italian, Indian, uh, and so on and so forth. But what's Instagrammable food? He said, you can do a Chinese Instagrammable food. You can do uh, an Indian Instagram food. Everything needs to look good on the screen. Oh, this is where we are going. We got to accept this. I can't be old school and be kind of mind blocked with this. What he was talking about, what Mr. Menon was talking about is engagement, shopper engagement. You got to engage the shopper. A live sushi counter or, or uh, a teppan uh, plate in front of the shopper, tossing what he likes in front of him uh, is... is it's not because uh, it's it's not because it cannot be done in the kitchen. It's being done because that's the way you engage with the shoppers. That's the way, like he rightly said, takes videos and posts it up. Uh, this is what's really matching. Shopper loyalty comes from engaging the shopper, getting him involved with what you do, giving him a say in what you do, and and this is what keeps our business going. And he will be your best ambassador. Have we reviewed our messaging? to ensure we are sensitive to our customers and partners' emotions. See, it's, it's so important that now we are, let's say, I would look at our business in a phase that's post-pandemic phase one. So I'm in a pandemic phase three at the moment. The emotions of the shopper in phase one, phase two, and phase three is so different. And his, his consumer behavior, his consumerism is different. So are we listening to this? And are we messaging with him? Are we communicating with him? Are we enabling him to manage his emotions? And this is so important in our business. We think this is beyond us, but no, you need to continuously engage with them. Even a simple commercial uh, a YouTube one, let's say 10 second, can end with a message to the shopper. And, and that's very, very important. What is our digital and social media strategy? Are we engaging with the latest trends in social media? I mean, if you see in the West, you will start seeing this product catalog, which has pictures of the products and the price. And this is the communication. Because at, there was a point in time, all you needed to ensure is you have the best assortment in your weekend promotion. You have the best price when compared to your competition. And definitely, you will have the best footfall into your stores. Because your weekend, which is your Friday, Saturday, Sunday, gives you... 45 to 50 percent of your sales of the week so if you secure maximum share of the pie during those days you're secure so what you do you compromise on your margins you give offers and make them come in and that's it you don't need to do anything more but today they have changed you have a generation that newspaper i mean circulation i don't need to tell you is dropped to an all-time low and it's an industry that's probably losing ground uh, I, I rarely, seldom see my son watching TV. So uh, even that's losing ground. So where are we? What are we hooked on to? It's the phones and, and it's, it's the social media on the phones. And if you see how the, more, the, the, the phone manufacturers have been innovating to make it more user-friendly and, and make it more addictive. And this is what's happening. So it's people like ourselves who need to continuously keep talking to our shoppers. We have to continuously evolve and mature our communication, our path, communication pattern and the advertising pattern that we follow. Uh, what is our inventor position and clear out strategy? Inventory is key. Okay, what really happens is uh, inventory is cash. It's cash on hold. So you need to have a continuous clearing methodology, especially when you have such 
situations. So you will overstock and then suddenly things have normalized and then you will start uh, seeing, oh my God, I need to clear this before expiry time. So managing inventory cycles are, are so important. So you need to have continuous inventory checks. You need to have continuous stock takes. You need to know exactly your system needs to, and, and all this depends on a strong IT system, a strong IT uh, environment and a support system and an ERP system that supports this heavily and analysts who can interpret these data and explain to you. So it's, it's so important that you manage inventory, of, especially when you look at a business like our size, about 500 million US, um, our, our, the stock holding that we have uh, is at any given day is 15 to 20 days stock. Uh, this is what we hold, but in that's average stock. But when you go by category, when you go by uh, cross section of what we merchandise, uh, there are these uh, categories that move slow, but you're always at the risk of expiry there. So there needed to be changes in the way we merchandise and we do our planograms post pandemic. Uh, change in shopper behavior meant change in the products on the shelf and how we see it's like this yeah you have a 12,000 square meter store you will have something like 3,000 linear meters of, of a particular category and you every every inch is money yeah so what we look at when we look at our stores we say what is the return per square meter what is the return per linear meter? When I say linear meter, is you see these line of shelves that go five base, one end to the other of the shelf, every linear meter has a threshold of return. And, and it's very, very important that you have the right merchandise because if you don't have the right merchandise, you know, your shelves are not going to be productive. A, a good store should turn around stock 15 days max. That should be the holding stock. So it's very important that you have the right assortment and you're ensured of the right assortment. Shouldn't we review, we need to, we need to go back. So each of us, when we look at uh, our plans for the year, we say, okay, this year we're gonna open 40 stores or 20 stores. Now that's changed. You, you, what you look at is, which is the format that we're gonna invest in? What is the channel of business that we're gonna invest in? And, and that's the way in which our, our thought process has to change. So store rollout strategies, channels and formats, uh, it all would depend on, on what exactly the, the customer or the shopper behavior and where is this leading to. So there are research houses that continuously does these researches and, and give us uh, inferences, give us data, give us research material that gives us an indication of where the market is going. And we start adapting our stores based on knowing where exactly the mindset of the shopper is. And then we start orienting ourselves. And being, like I said before, we need to throw our ball a good 10 years ahead of us. So what we are evolving today, the differentiator should differentiate amidst our competition and should not be easily adaptable by them and should remain an excitement for our shoppers for a period of at least three years. And then you've got to re-innovate and, and recreate and re uh, you know, invent your store. So it is a continuous uh, cycle of, of innovation that happens on our stores to keep the excitement going. Okay, now when you look at 65, 70 stores, I mean, today, if you look at the, the SPAR Global 13,000 stores, that's an entire estate. Not all of the stores make money. So in difficult times, you don't continue operating stores that don't make money. You know, if there is cash profit, operation profit, you keep going. But if it's eating out of your net profit, shut it down. And, and that's, that has been a learning for every single retailer because resources start to be scarce. How do we best manage our working capital? Ensure access to cash during a prolonged period of disruption. I mean, these, like I said, this manifestation is continuing. And if this manifestation continues and God forbid, it is not clubbed with anything else that can happen globally, God forbid. Because if it does, it's, you're going to have a prolonged period of disruption and it's the worst time. And I can tell you, there's no specialist who can come and give you any advice on how to run your businesses during this time because uh, one, nobody knows the business as well as we do. Nobody knows our businesses as well as we do. And there's no expert out of the business who, who has seen this before. It's, it's a new phenomenon that we're all facing. So shareholders, directors, people who run the business needed to trust their own people more than any hotshot consultant that can come in. Should all products and categories perform as they used to, like I said before, you know, personal care products may not present, may not grow at a pace and may not perform as well 
as the growth that you will see in home care after the pandemic and the growth in which you will see in home care and the profitability that you can gain in home care. So we needed to really start uh, drilling down from category level to single SKU level and, and understand how well these, these products are going to perform. So these were the key questions that as management, we needed to answer ourselves before we actually uh, trickle it down uh, to our teams and, and to the various levels in the hierarchy. Slide. So the executives and the board, what will be the key questions? How do we guarantee safeguard safety of our people? The most important thing. I heard uh, Mr. Menon say before, it's all right. Invest into your people when you can. Make them feel secure. I mean, we've been providing insurance for our staff probably a little over 15 years, medical insurance. Uh, it's important. Yes, awards are good. Uh, rewards are, are even better. Incentives are good. Bonuses are good. But there are certain soft aspects that a staff feels very good about. And that's when his baby is sick and he doesn't have to worry about his wallet. And he'll say, I love my company. If there are meals being provided at subsidized rates in the office, he's happy. And I'm talking about different levels. So there are certain fringe and certain soft facilities that you can provide your people that makes them feel very secure and they understand and they know that our company, people come first. How do we best manage our working capital? Ensure access to cash and a long period of disruption. See, this may not really come across to you all unless I give you an example. In our business, we gross about five and a half million dirhams a day. Some days it can go to seven and average would be five, five and a half million dirhams. Our payout average credit period is 60 days to 90 days. So I collect 150 million cash, which I pay out on an average of 65 to 70 days. This is working capital, right? It's a huge amount of money. Now, suddenly you have somebody, some wise guy who would come by and say, okay, you can use this money and make some extra buck by the time you pay your suppliers and you start reallocating your working capital. Mistake. You sometimes invest working capital into building your business. Wrong. What you do is you manage your treasury. This working capital comes into your treasury and your treasury can give you money. And it, you use that money, you don't use your principal. So it's very, very important on how you manage your working capital as you go forward in times like this because prolonged period of disruption is, is hefty. How do we conduct and maintain supply chain risk, mitigation, assessment, and intervention? This is exactly what I told you before about original equipment manufacturers, like for people like ourselves. I mean, today, if, if you guys know Nutella, uh, it's a hazelnut-based, uh, I'm sure you get it there. Uh, it's a hazelnut-based uh, bread spread, a whole lot of palm oil, so I'll tell you to keep away from it. But it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a very important uh, product in our, in our, in our shelves. Uh, almost every basket has one of it. It hasn't been available for the past eight, nine months, simply because uh, the supply chain issues are, are revolving around it. Today, if we want to start a new store, before we could get refrigeration assets and shelving and trolleys and checkouts into our stores in less than two months, now it takes about five to six months. If we are lucky, we will get it. So we need to know how to mitigate these risks and we need to intervene on this much ahead in time. How can we rapidly move supply to alternative route to market channels and safeguard our revenue? Find different ways in which you can mitigate and secure these risks. And how do we prepare for a long-term shift in the consumer behavior and channel preferences? Shopper behavior is the key. Your finger needs to be on top of it by the day. And that will depend on what channel preferences we will have while growing our business. Because it's the shop trend that decides which format we should actually grow and what size of stores should we have and where we should have. Should we go for out the city stores or should we be in, in, in downtown? Taking uh, uh, aspects on, 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 on ensuring that your business is sustainable and can wither such moments. Uh, retailers have to embrace digital and other technologies to 
create a seamless contact shopping experience that is now a go-to choice. This is something that I have discussed already, so let me not slide. Can you change? Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, a paradigm shift is in customer and shopper buying behavior. People have moved from offline to online, that is from brick and mortar to, to the online space, non-elastic to promotions, health and wellness high on agenda, shift in preferences and priorities, change in preferred channels, value-centric buying and communication pathway. Brick and mortar retention is through essence experiential shopping. So this is exact, I've, I've touched all these points in the past, so I think that's that's clear. I would like to conclude soon and, and open up the floor if you guys would like to talk. Yeah, let's go to the next slide now. There's a paradigm shift in commercial profitability and supplier behavior, retailer, okay, this is purely commercial aspects in our business. We don't really make selling, we don't really make money selling our products, but we make money buying. And our trade agreements are all on the scale that we develop in our buying. So it's like today, if I sit with PNG, it's about how much purchase that I can do from them, determine the back margins as we call it, so that we can sell and we can sell at the lowest and be as competitive as possible. So it's a, it's a, it's a shift, it's a paradigm shift that's moving from how we look at our profitability. So before it was volume commitment, now it is you buy by scale and it is called a triple net buying price. So before they would say, okay, you buy a hundred million, I will give you 10 million to invest into your stores. I will give you 10 million to invest into your marketing. I will give you 15 million for your promotions. Now, no, take that 35 million, reduce it from a buying price and give me a net net buying price. This way you ensure maximum profitability upfront so that your shoppers will benefit the most. Uh, previously, it used to be back margins principal manufacturers have trade marketing budgets and back-end rebates. This will all move into what we call a triple net buying price or a single buying price on a, on a, on a scale. Slide. Again, another paradigm shift is every stakeholder's expectations has changed, be it customers, be it operators, be it investors. New shopping patterns with higher reliance on online and delivery options is what we will see going forward. So, so be it the stakeholders, be it us who operate, be it the customers, everybody's expectations have changed from our business. And this change is, is, is good because it's going to lead to innovation. It's going to lead to better experiential uh, offerings at store level. And, and this is another paradigm shift that we have seen. Slide. And this is my last slide. Uh, it's been a long one. Uh, I usually have the benefit of managing these slides, but unfortunately, uh, let me make a confession. I have a new laptop, and I think that's the reason why that didn't happen. It's a new format. I just need to get used to it. And this is my last page. Most retailers, boards, directors, shareholders, they tend to bring in these so-called experts. Right? I touched this before. You know, the consultants like the KPMGs, the Deloitte's, uh, the Ernest & Young, PricewaterhouseCooper, and tell them, come and look into our business and tell us where we are going wrong. Honestly, I'll tell you, none of them can tell you as much as your supervisor at the shop floor. None of them can tell you as much your buyer in your commercial department, as much as the marketing specialist, as much as my God, the, the data interpreters, the analysts, you have all, we have all the knowledge that we need within our organization. So it's best not to depend on anybody external if you ever get into such circumstances and depend on the people you have, invest into them and take decisions based on their learnings. Sit around the table. I can tell you a bright idea come, can come from the boy who serves you coffee. He would just tell you what his wife's opinion was about the bread he bought from your store. And that's enough. That can lead you to bettering the shopper experience. Always, always, when you guys get into a get into a work environment, and when you guys you know move up in your hierarchy, always trust your people and unleash them. Give them the autonomy. They will make mistakes. They will make mistakes, 
everybody works better after the mistakes because success is somewhere in between those mistakes and and let them just unwind let unleash them don't hold them back don't be micromanagers be open minded broad minded let people perform allow them unleash them and you can see that you will be part of a team or you will own and build businesses that will move leaps and bounds ahead cross borders and boundaries you know be international entrepreneurs so you young aspirational business managers entrepreneurs investors that's my last pinch trust your people always unleash them and let them perform and that's my last slide thank you so much for your listening i'm sorry for the interruptions and the inconveniences that have been caused in the earlier stage i hope i've been able to come across thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, the floor is open the forum is open for question answer session kindly drop in your questions in the chat box i know this is the last session so if there's anybody remaining there any questions thank you sir for your earnest address you thank highlighted you. the company's strengths and core competencies you spoke on the four pillars of your company that is serving fresh providing value quality service and gave them the choice so you appreciated the fact and took pride stating that your company was one amongst the retail sector which ensured providing essential food service despite presence of high risk in the pandemic situation food retailers were one of the most essential services after medical principal learnings during the pandemic were shared by you like considering internal and external stakeholders on the on the same weight of relevance being agile in your approach scm was relooked at to ensure back end and front end integration marketing resilient strategies to encourage customer lo loyalty among the four p's of marketing the place p which stands for availability had taken place of promotion in the order of relevance also customer buying behavior shift has led companies to become more stronger through increased customer connect and adaptation of hybrid contactless concept business model so are also stated sustainable business model strategies are to be adopted in the coming times so concluded with you have the best within your organization if you just trust and unleash thank you thank you so much there is an important announcement for the paper presenters tomorrow we will have the research paper presentations by various research scholars students faculty and industry people scheduled from 10:15 am to 1:30 pm it is categorized under different tracks based on their specializations which are track 1 marketing track 2 finance track 3 human resource management track 4 general management track 5 business analytics and information technology track 6 operations and supply chain management the presenters will the presenters will have to join the respective zoom links for their presentation you will receive the zoom links on the national conference group on whatsapp to conclude the proceedings of day 1 i request dr rahul more convener for the national conference to propose a vote of thanks thank you richard i hope i am audible yes so you are uh, gratitude is the healthiest of uh, all human emotions the more you express gratitude for what you have the more like likely you will have even more to express gratitude for uh honorable dignitaries and most valued guest it's my privilege to propose vote of thanks on behalf of this esteemed institutions dr dy patil institute of management studies we want to express our gratitude to our chief guest mr jay shankar unithan managing director shankar selling system private limited guest of honor dr sushil kumar i am vishakha patnam and dr 
અને દોરો શું ઓડિશા ઓડિશા નેશનલ પોલિટેકનિકલ યુનિવર્સિટી યુક્રેન હુ હેવ ઓનર ટુ આવર ઓકેઝન a very heartly vote <coughs> of thanks to dr abhay badani head data science yatra.com mr manoj menon vice president of operations o group of hotel and mr bijoy thomas ulikel chief operating officer abu dhabi corporations and spa uae for gracing us with their valuable thoughts sparing time in spite of their busy schedules i extend my sincere thanks to management dy pims wing commander pvc patil retired executive director mr bharat chavan patil managing director operations professor dr karnure consultant director and dr jg patil head corporate relations for immense supports and guides to assure the best a special mention to our beloved director of dypms dr ashutosh misal for constant motivating guiding and inspiring us i also he deserve words of inspiration for the amount of meticulous planning that he has put up for the national conference and overall supervision i owe special gratitude to all distinguished participants and research scholar from india and abroad for bringing in their intellect and view point to the conference behind every successful event lie manifold attempt of our committed staff i would like to take a, a moment to acknowledge their immense contributions this day would have been a fit without the presence of our energetic students especially one who were involved through the various committee the toll can be uh, seen here i also extend my thanks to the teaching and non teaching staff for their exceptional mutual supports thank you one and all once again uh dear participants uh, very soon uh, you will get a one feedback link kindly feel this feedback form this feedback form will be used for your certificates thank you and thank you over to richer <coughs> richel thank you sir i request everyone to fill in the feedback forms i also request everyone to switch on their cameras for a group photo screen ansha the ppt
Praveen Kotwal, sir, are we done with the photos? Yes, sir. I'm done with. Okay, thank you. Ma'am, ma'am, ma I was not there for the photo. Hello. Who is this? Yes, ma'am. Oh, my camera is on. Let Let's click one more time. Let's click Hello. a photo once more. Wait, wait, wait. Where is that camera? You can see me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Rabin, okay. yes. take you. one second photo. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Bye bye. Take care. Here we sign out. Here we sign out. See you all tomorrow. You all can leave the meeting one by one.